Hello, I'm Laura Lott, President and CEO of the American Alliance of Museums. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this virtual symposium on climate in recognition of our world leaders convening at COP26 in Glasgow. The museum sector thrives on collaboration and the Alliance is so pleased to be here alongside esteemed partners, including the National Nordic Museum, an AAM member, the ICOM Sustainability Working Group, and the National Museum Directors Council in the UK. AAM is proud to be a collaborator and contributor led by our Environment and Climate Network, a group of passionate and knowledgeable volunteers. Climate and environment issues are integral to AAM's work to help museums better define, address, measure, and communicate their social and community impacts, as well as to our long-standing commitment to diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion across the museum sector. As we have seen even more vividly in recent years, those suffering from the impact of climate change are our most vulnerable populations, and we have an obligation to reach, support, and include them. And of course, our museum's precious collections are regularly threatened by climate events today. Many museums across the globe have experienced the direct effects of wildfires and flooding and severe weather in the last few years, driven by the climate crisis. A global issue demands a global solution. This opportunity to learn from our neighbor, neighbors to the north and around the world is so valuable. Thank you for including the American Alliance of Museums. I look forward to a successful symposium. Dear friends and colleagues, it is a great pleasure to be with you today. Fighting the climate change and the loss of biodiversity is the ethical imperative of our time. The climate crisis is having a devastating impact on the world's natural and cultural heritage, tangible and intangible. The relations between man, the biosphere and the geosphere are tight. The cultures of the world, the cultures of the Anthropocene are suffering because landscape, natural resources and lovability are endangered. Indigenous communities are at the forefront. Not only are their livelihoods under threat, also their cultural heritage cannot survive without their natural habitats. Even native languages are in constant decline as a result of the climate crisis. Museums play a key role not only in fostering knowledge, awareness and behavior changes, but also in sustaining mitigation strategies. Museums are in a unique position to support environmental policies, disseminate scientific information and sustainable practices in the local communities. In September 2019, ICOM's General Assembly in Kyoto, Japan, passed the resolution on sustainability and the implementation of Agenda 2030. The United Nations 2030 Agenda has become the fundamental reference for ICOM's work over the next decade and beyond at national, regional and global levels. ICOM actively participated in the recent meeting of the G20 Ministers of Culture in Rome to make sure that decision makers across the world recognize and integrate museums in their policies addressing sustainability and climate crisis. In these efforts, ICOM is supported by the Working Group on Sustainability that is developing a global action plan for the implementation of Kyoto's resolution. I am proud that Maureen Rees, chair of our working group, is a member of the steering committee that have organized today's symposium. ICOM sustains museums all over the world so that they integrate the attainment of United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the fight for climate justice in their mission. 
global challenges call for global responses. International cooperation is needed now more than ever. ICOM calls museum to face the challenge and lead the change. Now is the time for new responsibility, the time for unity and cooperation. As ICOM's founding father stated in 1946, only together will we be able to move forward. Thanks for your attention. So hello everyone, I'm Chris Bruard, I'm Director of National Museums Scotland, uh, and I'm sorry I can't be with you today at On the Front Line, Arctic Museums and Climate Change, uh, but I wanted to leave a short digital message with the conference to wish you well uh, and to endorse its really important um, aims, particularly at a time when we in Scotland and the UK are engaged with the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, or COP26, uh, as it's come to be known. So I'm also here as a member of the UK's National Museum Directors Council to say how delighted we are through Nick Merriman to be part of the conference. National Museums Directors Council represents the leaders of the UK's national uh, museums and its major regional museums uh, in advocating for the importance of museums with uh, government policymakers and opinion formers. And for my own institution, National Museum Scotland's, we were founded in 1854 and we care for one of the largest and most diverse collections in the UK, comprising 12.4 million objects across science and technology, Scottish history and archaeology, natural sciences, world cultures and art and design. And we're represented over four museum sites uh, and a major collections and research facility uh, in Edinburgh. We engage with millions of visitors, both online and in normal times on site. At National Museum Scotland, we have a really innovative programme in place right now to complement COP, and that includes the exhibition Scotland's Climate Challenge, which showcases technological solutions to human-induced climate change. And our collecting uh, and research activities across climate change and threats to biodiversity loss will continue long after COP26. For example, uh, our travelling exhibition, Monkey Business, which uh, looks at the challenges facing the primate species, is currently at Nick's Museum, the Horniman Museum and, and Gardens in London. Uh, so we're very proactive uh, in ensuring that the message about biodiversity and climate change challenges getting out there way beyond COP26. And finally, we're very happy to be involved with this international event on Arctic museums and climate challenge because of the strengths of our own Arctic collections at National Museums of Scotland. We hold around 1,200 objects from Arctic peoples of international significance and many of them deriving from those very early European encounters in the region. And we're always keen to extend our networks and our partnership with respect to these collections. So I do hope you enjoy the conference and please, if you happen to be physically in Edinburgh at any time soon, then do come along to our museum in Chamber Street and say hello. Uh, we'd be, de be delighted to meet you. Uh, good luck and goodbye. Well, hello everyone and um, greetings to colleagues and friends from around the world. My name is Sam Alberti, like Chris Brewer. I'm at National Museum Scotland, which is of course right now COP26 country. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you again to On the Frontline Arctic Museums and Climate Change. My job today is to moderate the first of our fascinating papers and I'm delighted to introduce to you two colleagues from elsewhere in the UK, Dr. Amber Lincoln and Dr. Jago Cooper. 
Amber is curator uh, of the Americas at the British Museum and Jago is head curator of the Americas at the British Museum. And together they curated Arctic Culture and Climate, an exhibition that started around a year ago, um, but a very fine 360 degree tour remains on www.britishmuseum.org, which I was, uh, had great pleasure visiting yesterday. So I'd like now to hand over uh, Amber and Jay going to chat to us for about half an hour, and then there'll be um, a Q&A for about 15 minutes after that. You'll have the opportunity to put your questions in the chat. Amber, Jay go. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Sam. Um, unfortunately, Amber and I are on other sides of the Atlantic from each other today, so, um, so we can't do it joint side by side. So what I think we'll do is maybe I'll speak for a little bit about some of the background to the exhibition and then uh, Amber will take over and take you on a, a whirlwind tour of the 360. So perhaps I'll share my screen and just start with a, with a few slides. Um, so yeah, the reason that Amber and I are talking is because of Arctic culture and climate that was on at the British Museum earlier this year. Um, in terms of talking about its background, this is an exhibition that was in process for, for 10 years. And I, I think what's interesting is if I talk a little bit about that process of the decade uh, that went in the, in the planning and development of the exhibition and raised four particular issues that we faced um, in its development that I think indicate the changing landscape of museums and how climate change as a topic is, is currently uh, promoted and discussed in, in, our, in our environment. Um, with COP26 going on today, it really is a time of existential crisis for our, spe for our species. Every one of these big conference events seems to me to build a crescendo and then a slight like disappointment afterwards as, uh, as things sort of just bumble along in the sort of debates. But I think that what taking a sort of 10 year time slot does is it does show you how things have moved on. So, Let's think about history. Uh, this exhibition I pitched in 2001 at the British Museum to do a major exhibition on climate change. And it took an enormous amount of time to get through the sort of process to get both stakeholders internally and externally on board with that, with that process. The first of the sort of four barriers I saw back then in 2001 is something that I think has fundamentally changed. And that was that there was a perception uh, that there was no public interest in the topic of climate change. In 2001, it was seen as a, a, an exhibition that would only be held at the Science Museum, that climate change was a scientific problem with a technological solution. I think that's nearly everyone who is uh, at the symposium today is here because they disagree with that that sort of that statement, uh, and that they that they see also that climate change for me is fundamentally a, a social problem with a cultural solution. And I think that that landscape has fundamentally shifted. If you look at the public interest on climate change today, there is no doubt that all museums are engaging with this topic in a in a different way. So that issue of no interest, I think, has disappeared and gone away. But that was a barrier only 10 years ago. The second sort of issue that we faced, uh, and I feel like I should quote remarks that we got um, um, on this, which was that, was that um, the objects and material culture um, could not be used to tell the story of climate change. Um, and again, this is something that I, I fundamentally disagreed with then and disagree with today. I mean, if you look at the plethora uh, of artistic creations and makers and creators dealing with the issues of climate change today, the, you know, the museums of the world can be stocked with the most unbelievably fascinating exhibitions on this topic. And so that I thought was, you know, is just is, is, is a silly way of, of thinking about climate change through a, through a museum exhibit. But even if you took a narrow view of, of a place like the British Museum, which can sometimes take an archaeological view of material culture, then I think that, that archaeological objects still represent that interface between the human experience and the landscape. They reflect a symbology and understanding, a cultural understanding, and the diversity of that cultural understanding of relationships between humans and the natural world. And so therefore, all material culture forms part of that dialogue. And so I think that that is increasingly well understood and creates the sort of the, the mechanism by which all museums can deal with issues of climate change and perspectives on climate change in different ways. So when we started to get over those sort of first two, two barriers, 
And then instantly you realize, like everyone here who is a museum professional, that all exhibitions are a, a, a collaboration. They're all a collaboration of a huge number of different people. So today, Amber and myself uh, are talking, but in reality, these are the words of, of many, many people. And it was only Peter Louvers, Amber and I, who were based full time at the British Museum. But essentially it was a, a collective effort of, of an enormous number of people across the Circumpolar North and internationally. I don't know, Amber, if you want to say anything here about sort of that, that team, that team coordination. Uh, yeah, and I'll, we'll, I'll be talking more about it, but, but for sure, uh, I always uh, like to call it, uh, it was like a very large uh, Circumpolar community project. <laughs> so we'll, we'll talk, talk more about that. Absolutely. And also it was one which sort of built on predecessors. There have been Arctic projects, um, you know, which have been going at the British Museum for decades, well before our time of arrival. And all that sort of knowledge, all those relationships, all those networks of knowledge were essential in, in underpinning the framework for the development of the exhibition. And I think there's something interesting there about the time frames of museum development relationships and how they're developed. And then the sort of the, the, the existence of an exhibition, which is only open for a short time and tries to have a condensed narrative and to understanding the museum exhibition and the process of wider networks of relationship and changing landscapes is, is you know the vital one. Um, the third one I will talk about um, is, uh, is money because money is a fascinating one when it comes to thinking about how climate change exhibitions are developed within the museum environment different aspects of money let's start with sort of the institutional framework there was a perception when we were developing our exhibition that climate change was a political or a politicized topic and therefore there would be an impact on the corporate sort of relationships of a large national institution and this again is a landscape that i believe has changed in the last sort of five to ten years the perception that climate change is a politicized or a fringe issue is just now no longer acceptable or no longer even sort of the, the mainstay but also that, that, that money couldn't be generated for a climate change exhibition because of that sort of idea of politicization. And I think that that, that has, uh, has not only changed, in, 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 in those five years we found that actually people wanting to create like gifts for a climate change project like increased hugely during the time of the development of the exhibition and then the sort of the change or issue with money switched to sort of greenwashing and the ethics of taking money for climate change projects from either individuals or corporations or with that the understanding of the nature of that actual relationship and the relationship between all of the stakeholders involved in the planning of the exhibition with its delivery and this is definitely an issue which has not gone away how we start to understand how the communicated narratives of climate change experience on the global scale are going to be told and who is going to pay for them to be told. And in the museum landscape, this is one that we all struggle with in everyday um, aspects of our funding and the way that we communicate our messages. But with the climate change topic, this is particularly intriguing in how it can be developed. And perhaps in the question and answer, we can discuss it more. But I think that it's not something that can be ignored. It's something that has to be faced and understood, and it has to be grappled with in a, in a particularly distinctive way. And then the fourth one, which is uh, which is the which is the most annoying, I have to say, of all of the of the sort of barriers or challenges we faced in the development of the exhibition, was this idea that climate change as a topic is depressing for uh, a visitor, for, for, for public to start coming into an exhibition, and this is one that I just completely and utterly disagree with. Climate change is not in and of itself a depressing topic because it captures the essence of humanity. It captures the essence of how humans can deal and tackle with these issues in their own ways. And as you start to develop a, an exhibition on relationship to climate change, then going on that journey, starting to talk to people, understanding the mechanisms by which we are all gonna start adapting and creating resilient societies is incredibly inspiring. And it's an inspiring experience to develop an exhibition and it's a, an inspiring exhibition, I hope, for, for someone to experience and go around. So that idea that, it, that it's depressing, I think, is, is something we still need to, to tackle in, in, in the world of climate change communication in the museum sector, but I think Think that it's one that is easy to tackle because of the wonderful stories that can be told uh, and so hopefully I will now segue into the actual experience of that of the exhibition and some of those stories by passing over to Amber who will take us on a 360 tour of the exhibition today.
Great, thank you, Jago. And I am going to um, share my screen now. Okay. Um, so yes, hello. It's it's good to be here with all of you. And um, I'm I'm speaking from uh, Berkeley, California, the um, the ancestral homelands of the Huichen Ohlone people. Um, and I want to thank the National Nordic Museum uh, for hosting this this event. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm just looking forward to hearing so many of the panelists, many of whom um, I know and have worked with over the course of this exhibition that Jago and I are talking about. Um, and just a little heads up to um, acknowledgement of, of Peter Louvers, who I think is in the audience and um, was also a curator on this exhibition. And, and uh, hopefully he'll um, find an opportunity to speak uh, in throughout the day. Um, so like so many, um, events of last year, um, Arctic culture and climate um, was affected by the global pandemic. And so after, after delaying the show for several months, um, it was only available to the public for about one month. So the British Museum, for the, the first time ever, um, created this 360 degree tour. Um, and so this is what I'll be using to just highlight some of the points that, that I'd like to make today. Um, so really this exhibition is a celebration of indigenous Arctic peoples who have made warm and hospitable homelands out of ecosystems of ice today. Um, so it celebrates the, the fact that people continue to flourish in the face of dramatic social and environmental change. Um, but it also raises the question, uh, you know, if in fact, um, Sea ice levels are, are gone in 80 years, as, as many scientists predict. What happens to these rich uh, ways of life, these rich uh, groups of people who have, who have um, lived uh, along, uh, who have made these warm homelands in, in these ecosystems of ice? Um, so throughout the, the talk, I guess what, um, I, I just want to highlight a few tensions, uh, two, two tensions, in fact, that, that we sort of had throughout the exhibition. I thought Jago has mentioned a lot of them, um, the sort of, you know, the development of the exhibition. And then really when we're talking about the display, um, how did we, we tackle these? Nothing here is groundbreaking um, by pointing them out. Um, I'm sure so many of you are familiar with them, but but I but I hope that it might interest you to, to see how we we dealt with these tensions within the display and, and the choice of objects. So, firstly, as as Jago dis discussed, um, the museum institution sort of wavered a little bit on how how the climate change narrative should be presented in the exhibition. Um, so we thought to privilege indigenous Arctic people's experiences and perceptions of, of dealing with climate and dealing with change. Um, but with such a, a, a you know, public, uh, timely, important topic of climate change, um, you know, we were a little bit worried of how to keep the focus on what a changing Arctic has meant and continues to mean for the people who claim ancestral ties to the region. So we worried that sort of the Western and often um, uh, urban climate debates, assemblages of drivers, causes, uh, government responses or, or lack of response would take over the storyline. Um, so one of our best tools for uh, avoiding that was uh, our community partners and our advisory panel um, and, and taking guidance um, from, from our indigenous partners. Um, so many people from across the Arctic uh, shared insights, knowledge, and skills in order to really get it right. Um, uh, just as a slide, um, I think Anna Mayoli is in the audience and uh, I can't tell you how many times, how many emails or phone calls we sent back and forth. Um, with her just to get, um, you know, get the uh, mounting of this Sami Bakhti's clothing right, you know, so, so people really uh, were so generous. Um, so we specifically thank them at the, at the front of the exhibition and, um, and so many of these people in particular have been 
um, essential to uh, Peter Luber's and, and, and my understanding of the Arctic. Um, but following, following their advice um, uh, and, and their teachings in the exhibition sections and storylines, we really privileged indigenous Arctic people's perspectives by focusing on weather. And um, this was kind of important because while climate is an abstraction generated in models that can be measured over periods of time, weather is a lived experience. Um, so um, weather is really essential for um, Arctic traveling, for building, accessing foods and produce, processing materials um, and engaging in, in seasonal ceremonies and celebrations. So in, this, in these early sections, we really contextualized what it means to live with weather. Um, so for one, one more example, um, we created a, a light show that would um, kind of highlight for people how um, the light changes. And this is a sped up version, but essentially in the exhibition, uh, we had a two minutes for every month, a, a gradually changing light show. Um, that went into the background um, and this corresponded to a seasonal uh, sound date. So you would hear the, the rev of a, a snowmobile or, or the geese returning in the springtime. Um, as part of that, we also sought to, um, uh, to really focus on the knowledge uh, of, of hunting, uh, the knowledge of weather in, in all kinds of activities from hunting to reindeer herding to, to, to making um, clothing. Um, so in this section, um, you know, this beautiful sort of early 19th uh, century kayak and, and hunting gear um, is, is discussed in terms of the kinds of hunting knowledge that uh, it, it would require. So for instance, um, the late Delano Barr of Shishmaref, um, Alaska, demonstrated how he would use um, sunshine. And he explains, um, as the sun comes up in the horizon and when it's raining or when it's shining, to get near an animal, hunters approach them from under the sun because that animal is not going to look toward the sun. That was their expertise. So um, another example of um, using different elements of weather, um, uh, John C. Mukpa um, of uh, Mithi Metallic Nunavut would also explain how he would hunt, he would use wind uh, in order to hunt caribou and how important that was to be upwind of, of caribou. Um, in addition to the sort of um, hunting knowledge of uh, that was associated with, with weather, seamstresses too also used um, a number of properties of, of weather in order to make this all important, protective and beautiful clothing. So in Mithi Metallic, um, we worked with a group of seamstresses um, uh, who identified different weather properties um, to process uh, clothing. And in this particular film, um, uh, different uh, things which we're talking about how to make that very white, beautiful uh, white seal skin and the different properties of weather that they would use. So in terms of um, using the snow to preserve the hide until you were ready to use it. Um, uh, drying the hide out using the very, very coldest um, and driest month of February and March to get this very beautiful um, white hide called Nalua, um, for, uh, in particular for, for fancy boots. Um, so all of these um, examples were sort of uh, put into the exhibition. So in, in the hope that, you know, it, it, it was our hope that knowing the extent to which weather is woven into Arctic lives, um, we hope that this would collectively help us understand what global climate change means to Arctic people today, and what is at stake for their ways of life in this rapidly changing world. So, so Arctic culture and climate address climate change through the lens of weather. And by doing so, we tried to keep Arctic lives uh, central throughout the show. Um, a second tension that we had um, was um, 
sorry, I'm trying to second pension here, yeah, was was um, kind of developing the exhibition was um, trying to display the connections between rapid changes in weather resulting from climate change and the vast changes that indigenous Arctic people have faced as a result of colonialism. So indigenous scholars such as Kyle White explains that indigenous people often understand today's vulnerability to climate change as an intensification of colonial colonial induced environmental changes. Um, and so these have been, you know, part of a wider system of ex imperial expansion, forced religious conversion, settlement, residential schools. Um, but so following these scholars, um, Elizabeth Marino, for instance, um, Silla Watts Cloutier, the um, Inuit activist, um, you know, we wanted to highlight and contextualize climate change within colonialism. But you know, and this can be difficult using historical objects. So one way we ended up um, drawing these comparisons uh, was by highlighting the resilient strategies that indigenous Arctic people have used um, both to, to mitigate the challenges of both social and environmental change. Um, so we used examples from the Arctic deep past to highlight the earliest ancestors, how the earliest ancestors responded to climate shifts. Um, and, and basically, they, we were showing these resilient strategies were cultural adaptation, material innovation, and social cooperation. So, for example, in the section, um, in this very deep, deep past, um, you know, um, we talked about how Paleolithic hunters innovated with mammoth tusks as building material and weaponry. Um, with the warming of, of the climate and melting glaciers, the Beringian landmass submerged, um, giving gradual shape to the current geographic contours of the Bering Sea that divides Siberia and Alaska. The coastlines had great implications on the migrations of marine mammals. And so Arctic peoples adapted by altering their attention from terrestrial hunting to sea and, and walrus hunting, to seal and walrus hunting. Um, and, Finally, about 2000 years ago, we see the sort of population increase in these places throughout the Arctic that had extensive trade, you know, trading materials and ideas, uh, particularly along the Ob River. Um, you see this extensive trade networks uh, where people are really um, collaborating, right? Um, likewise, in the Bering Strait, um, a lot of ex extensive. Um, uh, social cooperation um, as people traded materials and travel distances. So these same strategies um, were used in the more recent history. Um, like their ancestors before them, Arctic people uh, faced social change, uh, you know, colonial expansion, uh, European exploration, the global fur trade, um, really through adaptation and uh, innovations and collaborations. So I'm going to move into this next section here. Um, just this, so this next section really highlights some of these material examples in which um, indigenous Arctic people are drawing on their um, their skills and knowledge, adapting to innovative uh, techniques, um, uh, creating different markets. Um, let me jump to, well, I'm moving my way here. There, yeah, jumping to um, different markets uh, with the fur trade, the decline of the fur trade. Um, Inuit created uh, just world renowned um, art markets, you know. Um, through the printmaking and the sculpture. Um, at the same time, uh, different hunters and reindeer herders quickly adopted and um, adapted to uh, snowmobile, this speedy transportation as uh, people were uh, forcibly settled into areas. So we really tried to highlight these connections in strategy. Uh, we brought this all the way up to the beginning uh, to the present day um, in these collaborations, 
uh, uh, with such indigenous organizations like the um, Inuit Circumpolar Council Alaska and the Shishmaraf Erosion and Site Expansion. Uh, sorry, I'm losing my, my way here. <laughs> These things can get a little bit tricky. Um, but the navigation here, um, let me just find, go back into these collaborations. So um, we asked um, the Shishmaraf Erosion and Site Expansion Coalition to sort of develop and, and uh, curate this section here. And, you know, they really highlighted um, the collaborations that, that they're working on today. In collaboration, we push for solutions that give us authority over our future and lead the way for others to consider their response to sea level rise. Shishmaraf is um, enduring rapid coastal erosion as um, pack ice is no longer protecting their coastlines in the, the big uh, fall storms. Um, so finally, I just, again, to show the, um, the, the end slide that I think Jago showed before, um, we ended on, um, we brought it back to the audience. Um, we left the Arctic and um, <clears throat> brought it back to the audience for this um, group of young people who created this art installation um, of Atigi Silapat. And I'm gonna try to get to it. Something. Um, here we go. Okay, so there we are. Um, a group of youth in Pangertung and Kinate Nunavut worked with an arts organization, the Embassy of the Imagination, to really reflect on this warm Arctic that they are inheriting and how you know they intend to, to deal with that. So um, it, in the, the final uh, part of the exhibition, it really asks us all to, to reflect uh, together in solidarity um, during this time of transformation. So I'm gonna end there and um, ask, stop sharing and ask Jager to come back. Um, and I think we will just sort of talk about uh, just briefly the final bits of, of you know, what this has meant and perhaps some of the legacies. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what's nice is that um, that one, the One Young World, that youth collective at the end who um, who created that artwork are actually talking at COP26 next Monday. Um, so they're doing a whole event talking about um, how youth uh, collectives across the globe are facing climate change together. So what's interesting is they've got the collective from the Arctic and then there's one from Palau in the Pacific and they're sort of having a conversation at COP talking about their experiences. Um, and then I suppose, yeah, it's what's interesting about the, you know, the museum and the, and the British Museum experience for me is like, it's how the narratives are communicated to the public. You know, the, an exhibition can have huge reach, um, even though the exhibition was only open for a month, like the 360 tour and the sort of video content that we've created has been watched by more than a million people across the world. And so you get great reach for some of the narratives that are coming through, but that process of selection could be quite challenging. And now I think it's about the legacy of how the, the, the exhibition and the, the sort of process, the journey it's all been on, everyone involved has been on, will, will continue in the years to come and sort of weave together with, I imagine, all of the other fantastic climate change exhibitions that participants in this uh, in this in this conference are going to be creating themselves. Yeah, great. And and just to say one one final word about I think, um, you know, this was a, a, a huge process, I think, for the museum as well. And um, one of the things that happened was, um, you know, as you all know, exhibitions is not the most green um, endeavor. Um, there's a lot of, um, un, you know, single use material um, and the whole construction of sites is, isn't always easy and, and of course transporting objects, loaned objects, you know, around the world. But um, in this process of developing the exhibition, um, the exhibition team just had a number of conversations. Uh, we thought really hard about how we can, um, you know, lighten our carbon footprint as well. So I think um, you know, it's about change. It's about changing minds and, and bringing different perspectives in as, as well as our own. So I think that was um, a huge, a huge part of this process as well. So I guess we're going to end there. And um, thank you again. Um, and 
we're happy to answer any questions. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you both. That was uh, fascinating um, and a really good use of the uh, of the, the virtual tool. That was super. So we, we got a guided tour from you uh, against all the odds, which is fantastic. And I can see that the uh, Q&A function is already live with questions, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just sneak in with a little nerdy one. Um, I, I really like your focus on the experience of weather. And I wondered, uh, did you, I couldn't spot, and maybe you mentioned whether meteorological equipment or instruments broadly construed from any culture featured in the, in the exhibition? Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, no, we, we, did, we did focus on um, ways in which, uh, so, so for instance, we had a, a, a really uh, wonderful um, uh, print by Kanoyuak Ashavak, um, Our Beautiful World, in which it, it sort of showcased the different weather patterns and um, throughout the year. Um, and then we certainly highlighted a lot of tools that people use to predict weather. You know, how, um, <clears throat> and this is everything from reading animal behavior to um, sort of, um, you know, th th that sort of classic Inuit, um, uh, uh, harpoon, uh, you have the, um, the down feathers to sort of sort of detect any of motion and, and movement in the, in the weather. Um, but definitely discussed, you know, brought in a lot of the, um, the knowledge uh, that, you know, um, hunters and reindeer herders have of, of, of using uh, weather, even wind direction to predict um, certain things. And, and then of course, how these seamstresses use all of these properties of weather to sort of make clothing, you know, and so, um, but not in the sense of, you know, classic meteorological tools, I suppose. Jago, do you want to add? Well, no, I just think it's a really interesting point that, that, I mean, that, that, that what the exhibition did was change people's perceptions, like a UK visitor, about how you experience the weather. You know, that was the point of the exhibition in many ways. Like people are used to seeing the weather channel and the news after the news, they see the weather and that's their experience of it. But in this with that, the material objects themselves created in a way their own meteorological understandings because of the process with which weather played a part in their creation and the interaction of people using the objects with their environment. And so I think that that, that sort of formed a sort of a shift in perception of how weather was experienced. And so in a way, each object was a meteorological indicator, but just told through a different way. Yeah, I like that. And, you know, given those, those of us resident in the, in the British Isles, it's nothing we like better than, than talking about the weather. Um, so we had a, a couple of related questions about <laughs> coming from museum professionals, uh, certainly one from Joyce Lee and one, I think, from Nick Merriman or a colleague at the Horniman. Um, do you, the latter was asking, do you have any evidence of the impact of the carbon impact, I presume, of the, ah, no. So I will read the question, actually, because you can answer it how you like, whether you have evidence of the impact of the physical exhibition compared with the online version. Now, I, I'd immediately read that as carbon impact, but perhaps our, our questioner, you know, w wants to leave it to you. Sure. I think I read it as a, as a sort of visitor experience question. Yeah. So I'll answer yeah. it on that front. But um, I think that it's a very interesting difference. Like, I like digital as a form of, of interaction. Like, your reach is huge in how many people you can reach. And like, you know, 10 to 20 times as many people saw the video as a, a, to introduction that Amber and I created that, than will ever actually visit the experience of the exhibition. But I think the sort of the qualitative experience, the impactful nature of the physical experience of seeing material objects and being within that environment, like pedagogically, like how people think, you can't replace that. You can't replace that impact of experience and memory and how the human brain remembers going around a physical exhibition. I think that that depth of, 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 of impact is, is slightly different. So it's a sort of, for me, it's a play between reach versus quality of experience. But I don't know. And that, you think. And that was that was the the intended meaning of the of the question, rather than my rather earlier. Amber, did you want to follow up on that? Well, I think um, you know, like I, I really, it was it's such a it's such a balance because of course we wanted people in in the north to be able to see this, and um, and so while the the digital element enabled that. Um, to a much greater extent than we ever could have, you know, brought people down to, to London. Um, 
I think what Jago <clears throat> is talking about, I think perhaps one thing that's maybe a little bit different about the British Museum audience as opposed to some of uh, the audiences in, in uh, the museums represented here, is, um, the London public has very little knowledge of the Arctic. And so when you actually had, I mean, we did focus groups where, where people um, struggled to find uh, the Arctic on a map. And when we, when we placed like the carpet, you know, from the carpet map, it was uh, from the Arctic perspective. I mean, that was kind of transformational for people because not only did they see this, um, that the Arctic was in fact like a connected region, you know, different countries and different indigenous groups were, were not like on the top of the world, but they were connected to each other. Um, that was transformational, but they could also walk, you know, so you're getting this like, you know, this very important um, phenomenological sort of uh, reinforcement. You're, you're, you can actually step, have one foot on Chukotka and one foot on Alaska. And you really, you know, that, that messaging really is conveyed so beautifully in, in that physical sense. So, so it's always a balance, but I think, you know, this is the way to go. You just have both. <laughs> And Joyce did have a question that is about carbon impact, wondering if you used any virtual couriering for your, for your loans to tr cut down on your carbon travel, travel carbon? We did. In fact, um, they, well, it, but not necessarily for climate reasons, but uh, because of the pandemic, we ended up having to do pretty much everything virtual. Um, and so that was quite, a, you know, a challenge, um, just sort of, um, you know, that was new. And, and as we all know, museum professionals sort of like to stick with what we're comfortable with. Um, so, uh, but that definitely helped uh, and it enabled for us to get loans in, in um, some places where we wouldn't have been able to get the loans from Russia, for instance. So, yeah. And for me, it was a moment of real museum collegiality, like the way that all of our lending institutions came together to sort of work through that issue and, and come together in a really positive way was incredible because for a while it was going to be, maybe the exhibition wouldn't be able to happen, but like then it comes camera, so many big places that came through and really helped us out. And, uh, and that was like, I thought it was good, good moment of museological collaboration. Absolutely, yeah. Another really good question has come in, uh, complimenting you on a wonderful exhibit, but asking how does it make the point about the current rate of change being unprecedented? Uh, the question of fears this might get lost with this kind of long jury focus on historical artifacts as well as contemporary. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, like we dealt with that in the exhibition in terms of how we did it in terms of time and perceptions of time. Um, and I think that you, you sort of, you started off in the contemporary, then you went through the sort of change of perception of how we're going to deal with the issue. Then you went archaeological, and then you were brought back up to the present. And then when you came through that, that final, you know, the, the section on it and see the, the Shishmaraf example, you know, there's no doubt about the accelerations and the direct human impacts that are happening today. So I think that um, we sort of dealt with it in terms of a sort of a, a natural fluctuations versus sort of anthropogenic climate change. Um, but I suppose touching on that, the idea of like, you know, calamitous, you know, you don't want to create an atmosphere of sort of, you know, calamity or disaster in terms of that sense of current rapidity of change. We wanted to provide a sort of context for current change within that wider framework. But, um, but I think we did deal with that idea of natural versus anthropogenic, the great acceleration, the unprecedented nature of change today. Yeah, and I think um, we, you know, we, we dealt with that very specifically by just hitting it head on, you know, um, the climate fluctuation. So we, we never used the word climate change when we were talking about um, changes to climate in the deep past. Um, so we, we talked about climate fluctuations and we you know, very specifically said um, climate fluctuations um, archeologically were, were much different than what's happening today, you know, which the changes are happening within a generation. The other way we did this was um, by simply having videos of uh, people like um, Delano Barr, um, you know, really talking about what is different now about uh, the climate change that um, people in the Arctic are experiencing. And, you know, just uh, the, the changes in weather, gradual changes in weather patterns of the past. Um, so I think that that was two ways where we really made that, um, that point clear. 
And then I suspect a final one, because this is a, a maybe maybe chunky to answer. Um, Lauren Wheeler asks um, about the role of indigenous people of the Arctic playing in the development of the exhibit as a whole. So beyond the contemporary components and pulling from the museum's archives, were indigenous people of the Arctic involved in contextualizing the archeological, historical artifacts within their current cultural practices and their own responses to climate change? Well, which of you wants to go first on that? <laughs> you know, in terms of the archeological, um, you know, we had, um, I had been, I had participated in uh, a, a number of, um, museum documentation visits with uh, Anupiat um, from Alaska and uh, uh, Inunate from, from Canada. And, but the, the majority of, we really took an archeological perspective at that, at that place. And that was quite a, a deliberate decision that I'm, I'm sure not everyone would agree with. Um, but again, it's going back to this balance between um, we really we really wanted to show climate change within this long history. We wanted to give it, you know, this depth, um, and so it kind of made sense to sort of show these archaeological sort of time periods um, and what is different and what is the same about them. Do you want to add, yeah. Jacob? Do I just the only thing I would add is just that um, it's just sort of paying some respect to the time of the of the museum and Jonathan King, our predecessor, yeah. who was a great focal point on the Arctic throughout his career at the British Museum over many decades. And his work on collaborative projects with Arctic communities since the 1970s, 80s, um, underpinned the documentation programs on our sort of database systems, which are fully led by, by sort of sort of collaboratively developed ideas about object descriptions and labels and how things are talked about and how things are described. And that sort of core knowledge built over many, many decades sort of underpinned the sort of documented framework within which the objects themselves then constructed the exhibition narrative. So I think there are sort of deeper timescales there as well in yeah. terms of how that participation has been going on. Well, look, I mean, the questions are still coming through thick and fast. We won't have time to talk now, but maybe later about the ethical imperative to talk about the depressing elements of climate change. And perhaps we are bound to do this, Jago. Uh, there are questions around um, compensation and what modes of exchange and dialogue between yourselves um, and your, your collaborators around the world. But look, there's always going to be lots and lots of questions about such a fascinating product and a really intriguing process but I've really enjoyed this uh Jago Amber thank you so much for for kicking us off so eloquently um and collegially and answering the questions you know frankly and openly um I uh, think that's been a, a real a really nice start um so thank you both I'm sure there's a there's a round of applause going on around the world right now um but while that you know while the clapping thunders on um transcontinentally um i'll uh, uh say goodbye and hand over to to joyce lee who is chair of the american association of museums environment and climate network who's going to lead us in the next phase of this fascinating um uh, symposium thanks very much thank you thanks sam thanks everyone wow what a session hello I'm Joyce Lee from Indigo JLD and one of the lead organizers of this symposium and head of AEM ECN, Environment Climate Network. We hope you enjoy the program so far and ready for intermission video. In that you may ask why we are sharing these museums far from the Arctic North today. Because to support our neighbors to the North, all of us below the Arctic Circle could be pulling in our weight to stop pollution. Museums that are moving towards net zero tomorrow are our leaders today. So we hope you'll enjoy this short video called Museums Towards Net Zero, as well as the Nordic music. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Maureen Rees. I work at Bremen Museum on the northeast Arctic coast of Norway. I'm also chair of the of ICON's working group on sustainability. <clears throat> I have the privilege of introducing the three distinguished speakers in the first session of the symposium addressing the impact of climate change on indigenous communities. As an introduction to the session, I would draw your attention to a significant announcement at COP26 yesterday. A World Leaders Summit pledged to invest 1.7 billion US dollars to help indigenous and local communities to protect the biodiverse tropical forests that are vital to protecting the planet from climate change, biodiversity loss, and pandemic risk. In raising the visibility of the Indigenous Peoples, the World Leader Summit committed delivering funding directly to communities and promised them a role in decision making and design of climate programs. To support the advancement of Indigenous Peoples and local communities, rights and greater recognition and rewards for their role as guardians of forests and nature. Indigenous Peoples and local communities manage half of the world's land and care for more than 80% of the Earth's biodiversity. The evidence is overwhelming that they are nature's most effective guardians and they should be at the heart of nature-based solutions to the climate emergency. This is true of the indigenous communities living in the Arctic, which as we know is warming up at up to three times the rate of the rest of the world. <clears throat> Excuse me. I would now like to invite the first of our speakers, Kaiser Kulilok from Aita, the Swedish Mountain and Sami Museum. Museum. The floor is yours. So, thank you so much for this invitation. So, first of all, I want to introduce myself. My name is Kulilok, Kaiser Kulilok. Um, I work at the museum, Aita Museum. And uh, I'm also a member of the board of ICOM Sweden. I'm a researcher. Uh, I'm a doctor in ethnography. And uh, IT is uh, the principal museum of Sami culture in Sweden. It is a special museum for the mountain region. And here's a Google map so you can orientate yourself where we are. Sami is uh, an indigenous people that today lives in four countries. And uh, the reason behind this is that the Sami as a people, we were here first, but other groups of people came and divided our land and decided where the nation borders should be. And these historical events strongly influence our lives, our thoughts and our feelings. And the impact on our ancestors have an impact on us, Sami, today. We have different relations to the land, to the animals, and to the individual understanding of what it is to be a Sami. And what I would talk about today is the research done here at the Museum. The research I'm presenting is from my work with the local reindeer herding community. Uh, I have uh, interviewed Sami about the conditions for raiding husbandry today and the changes over time. The research I do is based on participant research with embodied and localized narratives. And the narratives are about change change in people's lives, which uh, to a large degree are connected to the changes in climate and weather. Reindeer husbandry's traditional livelihoods, which is close to nature, makes it particularly exposed to these changes. And the narratives mirrors 
Sami struggle with uh, multiple stresses in the daily life. Uh, we know the importance of documenting and communicating the challenges we are facing. And one way to do this is to use digital technology, which I will be talking about today. But first, I, I want to do a, a quick look at the context, reigning husbandry in Sweden. Uh, this is uh, the little girl sitting on the reindeer is one of my participants that I've been interviewing. She's in her 90s now. So this picture is from 1950s. And uh, reindeer husbandry has existed for several hundred years. And the reindeer has been used as a pack or draft animal. The whole family moved with the reindeer the whole year around. And that way you create this close human animal relation. And the family lived in a a Sami town, the whole year around, like this one. Adaption to cold climate has been the basis knowledge in Sami culture. Traditional, all the part of the reindeer were used. And this is my daughter taking from the slaughter of the reindeer. I like to bring my family in with my presentations. This is her when she was younger. Uh, so the reindeer has provided us with both meat, skin, and other useful objects. And nowadays, reindeer are herded most for the meat. And the families are no longer moving with the reindeer the whole year around. Uh, instead, there's just a few amount of people that are engaged with herding the reindeer over the whole year. And the reindeer is described as the cultural basis of Sami, even though there are a small, small number of Sami people who live as active reindeer herders. And the base of husbandry is that the reindeer are roaming free, but the area where they are allowed to roam free is regulated. Reindeer husbandry is competing about the land with other interests, such as industries, forestry, mining and tourists, etc. And on top of that, we have the changes of the climate. So how should we be able to show and um, to the outside world or each other that the land we use has a special significance or that the land is in changing? Well, previously, oral history has been of great importance and it still is. Another way is to use digital technology to provide relevant documentation. The radio herders have adopted a range of strategies and approaches in dealing with impacts and use of digital technology is one way to deal with that. Following, monitoring the reindeer is an important task for the reindeer herders. And in the last decades, with increased access to internet, reindeer husbandry has been moving towards use of GPS trackers on the reindeer, where the reindeer migration can be followed on the reindeer owner's computer or the telephone. Uh, herders have bought a couple of colors to track and monitor the reindeer. And as you can see, the GPS colors are attached around the reindeer neck. And with the great GPS transmitters, the reindeer movements create digital maps that show the reindeer use of land. The reindeer's coordinates are shown in real time or, or almost in real time on a map. Uh, and often they heard a look at their phone to get the information of where the reindeer is located and how it has moved. And the effect produced by the GPS color 
enhances the reindeer herder on two levels. In everyday practice and in meeting with other stakeholders. The reindeer is grazing lichen on the ground under the snow. And when temperature is fluctuating, uh, there will be ice on the ground, prohibiting the reindeer to reach to the lichen. So when the land is changing, due to example, changes in temperature, the reindeer use of land is also changing. They might not move as they used to do to certain areas. They will maybe choose to go to other areas. And then with this technology, the herder can follow the reindeer as they change the movement patterns. And the digital traces that the animal leave behind can be used as document that certain areas are important to the Sami. And this in turn can be communicated to other users of the same areas. And in this way, one can gain a greater understanding of the reindeer use of land. And it makes the world of husbandry more understandable for other actors. And that is important for us. In discussion with other stakeholders, it is important for the Sami community to be able to visualize and communicate this use. And in the Sami context, knowledge have been never been written down, but rested in each individual. And it's been communicated verbally from generation to generation. Uh, but to communicate this knowledge to an outside part, such as authorities or developers and so on, who lack this understanding of the need of grazing land, these GPS maps can act as mediators. The GPS map gives the reindeer herders an opportunity to talk the same language as both parts can discuss on the basis of a map. And the position from the GPS color can also be stored and the herder can get long-term picture of how the reindeer move and where they are. So the red dots that you see here is from reindeer with GPS color over a period of time. And the fact is that in discussion with mining companies, forest companies and so on, these maps created by the movement of the reindeer are considered as facts. Data is often regarded by other stakeholders as objective data that is reliable. That is regarded as fact in contrast to what reindeer herders verbally says, which is based on their traditional knowledge. Uh, there is an increase in engagement with, with uh, traditional knowledge, but still there is often regarded as a difference between scientific knowledge and traditional knowledge. Scientific knowledge is often seen as objective, while traditional knowledge is regarded as subjective. And from the herder's perspective, the information of DPS color is not new, but it backs up what they already know and what they already says. So I'm going to conclude this by uh, saying this is uh, GPS color is like an empowering tool for, for the community, for the Sami radio herding community in communication with other stakeholders. And the narrative mirrors Sami struggle with multiple stresses in their daily life. And we know the importance of documenting and communicating the challenges that we are facing. And one way to do that is to use this di digital technology, which I have shown very briefly. Uh, and I, as a local museum, want to mirror local questions, such as how to meet challenges, 
in everyday life from an inside perspective. Uh, and uh, that's why I show this research as an example of this today. Thank you. Thank you, Kaiser. <clears throat> Our second speaker today is uh, Anne May Olli, who is a Northern, Norwegian Northern Sami. Master in Conservation from the University of Oslo. Uh, she's also director at the largest Sami museum in Norway, Hidu Dotta Museet. This consists of five local museums in the western part of Finnmark in Northern Norway. Anne May has worked as a conservator at one of the local museums in RDM for many years with emphasis on documentation of traditional Sami technology and its use in conservation. She is also a farmer with milk production and her husband is a reindeer pastoralist. The floor is yours, Anne. I will talk about how the climate changes are uh, affecting the agriculture, reindeer husbandry and our traditional knowledge, or is it? Frost cold winter and long bright summer nights provide special growing condition and characterize the Arctic agriculture. For example, grass, vegetables and berries will be sweeter due to photosynthesis around the clock during the growing season. The meat from grazing animals without compound feed shows a higher proportion of, for example, antioxidants, vitamin E and selenium in reindeer meat. The quality and components of meat and milk are affected by the plants the animals eat. The plants in turn are affected by climate. Agriculture in Karasok, Finnmark, Northern Norway is located in agroclimate zone six. It is a climate zone that is primarily suitable for rough cultivations, like grazing animals, animal husbandry. In this zone, about 21% is arable land. The climate changes we are experiencing are increased temperatures and more pre precipitation, which have positive and negative uh, aspects for agriculture. The positive ones is new species, very, very varieties can survive in our areas, like new grasses and plants in production. Warmer climate gives better growing seasons, more moving. Negative increased precip precipitation, runoff, floods, landslides, extreme weather such as increased wine, wind, wind, wind and torrential rain. Though in some areas it is quite little rain. More unstable uh, unstable uh, winters, like uh, mild um, and cold in a row. Winter stress with little snow, where the poor, uh, there is poor protection against cold and frost damage. Ice fire, it is like mild and then freezes. Uh, there will be ice on the ground and the sun shines on the ice when it's sun, it uh, will be hot under the ice and the grass actually will burn or die out. New plants will take over the habitats and orchid plants may disappear. Increased temperature gives new insects, parasites and microorganisms. More precipita precipitation will affect the prey quality of the grass. More surface water, more wet and raw, leaching of seed and all your crops uh, have poorer growth conditions and new diseases in plants and animals. Reindeer husbandry is based on grazing and is completely dependent on the natural conditions. Climate change is forcing reindeer husbandry to deal with same consequences that agriculture is experiencing. Higher temperatures and more precipitation or more snow and more rain. And actually, if you see the, the picture, you will see that it's quite icy. Uh, in the nature. The consequences are tundra areas disappear, reduce snow covering the land, actually the 
uh, it will be more frost uh, in the ground uh, and more wet and also muddy. And your diseases and these changes, will they change the quality? Will the reindeer meat have a different taste when they are eating new plants and change the growing condition for both reindeers and plants? Traditional knowledge is a cumulative experience of indigenous peoples and local communities accumulated over hundreds of years based on a traditional lifestyle and on the use and protection of resources in re regions where they live and manage. And even though we are now using snowmobiles in helping, the uh, where we move the reindeers and how we do that is actually still the traditional knowledge, even though we have new equipment to do that. The headline in Patricia Cochran's article, what is traditional knowledge? When an elder dies, a library burns from 1997, illustrates the importance of traditional knowledge and the transfer of this knowledge in society not just in an indigenous society. Traditional knowledge is best preserved through active use and must be passed on to the next generation in order to survive. Preserve in this context does not mean preserve as in status quo. Traditional knowledge is not static, but change, change and is renewed continuously. Our first Sami parliament president in Norway, Ole Hendrik Magga, did say in 2003, indigenous uh, traditional knowledge and traditional cultural experiences that what we today sometimes prefer to as their cultural heritage arises as a result of a particular way of life. It is not a result of one or a group of individuals and diverse. Indigenous traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions rests in the collective rather than with specific individuals. It is modified and enlarged over time from one generation to the next. Climate change could affect our traditional knowledge, also to the point that knowledge is lost when, it's, when it is no longer in use. Knowledge can become wrong when plants animal and insects have changed or moved their growth areas. Traditional knowledge is knowledge that also changes in line with lifestyle. But if the changes come too fast, new plants, insects and animals species shift or take over the attic, what then happens to the traditional practices over generations? We don't know all the consequences of uh, climate change. And the museum should be a part of these discussions, for not only are the climate a threat to the way of life as we know it today, but that the Sami people is also questioning, are we going to pay the price for the green shift for the future? The windmills are also coming and it's taken the poor um, or the grazing areas and this, the areas are getting smaller and smaller. So that is the question that we as a museum also be, will be a part to be, uh, to be, yeah, to be part of the discussion to in the future. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Anne May. Um, we now will move on to our final speaker. That's uh, Dr. Mike O'Rourke, who's a climate archeologist at the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Center. Mike, the floor is yours. All right. So thanks again, Maureen, and thanks to everyone who's joining us today. Uh, before I get started, I'd just like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Inuvik. And so I pay my respects to the Inuvialuit and Gwich'in, whose ancestral lands I'm speaking to you from. And in so doing, I pay my respects to the ancestors of this place. Koyanaini, Masi, thank you. So my name is Michael Rourke. I'm an anthropological archaeologist by training, which means that while I focus on the material remains of the past, I approach those remains through an anthropological lens. 
And I hold a position with the Culture and Heritage Division of the Government of the Northwest Territories, um, which is largely housed, with the exception of myself, at the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Centre, uh, which is the Territorial Museum and Archives located in Yellowknife. In my role as the NWT climate change archaeologist, I'm responsible for addressing the impacts that climate change is having on the material remains of Inuvialuit ancestral lifeways, impacts which are projected to increase in frequency and severity in the years ahead. Uh, but before I get too far into that discussion, I'd like to provide a bit of context for you first. Now, I should note at this time that you're going to hear me using the term Inuit Nuningat to describe what is most often referred to as Arctic Canada. And this is the term that the Inuit Tepirit Kanatami organization has requested that people use when referring to the homelands of Canadian Inuit. It's important to consider this, this isn't just a change in terminology. This is a change in the way that we conceptualize the area overall into more political, social, and humanistic terms. Now, there are four distinct Inuit regions in Canada, and I have the privilege of being able to work with the Inuvialuit whose ancestors have called the Western extent of Inuit Nunangat home since time immemorial. Now, rather than pitching an outsider's account, I'll describe the Inuvialuit in their own terms, with a description drawn from the Inuvialuit Wildlife Management Advisory Council website. So to quote, Inuvialuit means the real people, and it is believed that the population descended from the Thule people who once lived in the Arctic. They migrated from the Bering Sea region and settled on the edge of the Beaufort Sea at the mouth of the Mackenzie River some 800 years ago. Drawing on ancient cultural traditions, they adapted to new resources and challenges. So today, many of the 5,000 Inuvialuit reside in the communities of Aklavik, which you can see here on the map, Aklavik, Inuvik, Tuktoyaktuk, Palatuk, Uluhaktuk, and Saks Harbor, or Ikahawak. Uh, also shown in this map is the Inuvialuit settlement region, uh, which is the area that was demarcated for use by Inuvialuit with rights over lands and resources therein. Uh, and that was done through the Western Arctic claim, the first comprehensive land claim in the Northwest Territories, also referred to as the Inuvialuit final agreement, uh, which was struck among a variety of other reasons to preserve Inuvialuit cultural identity and values within a changing Northern society. So to give you an idea of the kinds of ancestral material remains that archaeologists commonly work with in Western Inuit Nunangat, the Nuvialuit ancestors left traces of the lifeways on the landscape over the centuries, uh, many of which have been very well preserved where they were left owing to the influence of permafrost, which helps stabilize delicate organic remains that are largely absent from other early human occupation sites outside of the circumpolar Arctic. One of the most visible examples of these remains is the Agleriwak, more commonly referred to as the semi-subterranean sod house. You can see in this cutaway of artist's rendition of an Agleriwak, that these houses consisted of an entrance passage. Uh, over here on the right, you can see an individual looking down into the entrance passage. Uh, these also acted as cold traps, so keeping the cold air out of the main living area. The living area itself was accessed through a katak, uh, which was a portal on the floor into the main room. You can see one individual coming up through the katak into the main floor here. And this living area primarily consisted of a communal floor area uh, with one to three alcoves situated around the main floor, each of which would have been used by an individual family group. The Gluriwak and much of the mainland and Uvialuit settlement region were made from the abundant driftwood resources, which were provided by within the otherwise treeless region by the discharge of the Mackenzie River into the Beaufort Sea. They can see this image in the upper right. This is a recreation of an Igluriwak, which is in the community of Tuktayaktuk. Uh, this one does not have the sod on the sides. It's showing kind of that wooden superstructure underneath. Uh, there is another uh, Igluriwak in Tuktayaktuk, which is sod covered. It's actually beautiful inside. Um, you can hold public events there. Really a stunning example of early uh, Igluriwak styles. And down below here at the bottom right, uh, this is an Aglariwak out at the McKinley Bay area. And this is typically what archaeologists will find when they're out on the land. Uh, so you can see this is the sod berm around the outside of the house, which would have collapsed slowly with time. Central depression representing the floor area. And this one actually does have an entrance passage, which looks like a trench coming out of the main area, uh, heading off towards the beach. Now, there are, however, other more portable elements which have survived into the present day. And this slide shows just a few examples of the incredible material record of Inuvialuit ancestral lifeways. Uh, you can see here a selection of blades. Uh, these were collected from a beach, so these have actually washed out of an ancestral site in the area. 
uh, incredibly, just beautifully decorated combs. This one just coming over the ground at the village site of Kukpak on the East Channel of the Mackenzie River. Uh, needle cases, ornately decorated quite often, holding really critical technologies uh, for survival in the region through the production of skin clothing. And this is actually a composite tool. It's a woodworking tool uh, that hand adds. And we have a wooden handle uh, with the lashing point still intact, uh, giant, really heavy whale bone as a socket, and then this incredible uh, adze blade at the end, uh, sitting as it would have been left probably five, 600 years ago. Um, and again, really unique to the area throughout Inuit Nuningat, this reliance on wood in the Western extent is fairly special for the region. Now I should note at this point, every one of these objects was either located on a beach in the vicinity of an eroding village site or recovered during the excavation of an actively eroding Aglurioac feature. So everything shown here has been or was in the process of being impacted by the cumulative effects of climate change. So we see a lot of different impacts in the region. Uh, these are just a few of the ones that were drawn from the archaeological inventory, which lists the types of impacts that are taking place on each individual ancestral site. Uh, so coastal erosion, permafrost melt, sea level rise. We're seeing more lightning strikes and as a result more tundra fires because of the increased temperatures, convection cells, and therefore storm fronts, uh, vegetation growth, which has implications for buried wood materials, so on and so forth. Uh, the three real drivers, though, for impacts within the region are coastal erosion, permafrost melt, and sea level rise. So coastal erosion is having a really pretty significant uh, immediate mechanical impact on these ancestral sites. Uh, here is a Glurioac feature at the village of Kukpak. Um, you can see these are these three alcoves that I had mentioned previously, central floor area, and the entrance passage came out this way. This is actually a bluff. So all of this vegetation is collapsed vegetation going down to the beach about two meters below. So we were actively excavating um, an eroding feature at that point. Uh, these are some of the objects that were located on the beach below that Aglariwak feature, uh, literally collected during our tea breaks in the morning and the afternoon. So maybe a week worth of walking along the beach and finding those materials. Uh, so really, I mean, the volume of ancestral materials that are washing out of these sites is pretty remarkable. Uh, this is, in, again, the Glurioac at McKinley Bay, but just showing over the three-year period that we were visiting doing surveys, and I should mention that that was through my PhD work with the Arctic Char Project, or Arctic Cultural Heritage at Risk, uh, which was directed by Professor Max Friesen at the University of Toronto. Um, quite frankly, it was tragic to see this house ultimately tip off into the beach. Um, incredible to show up that year in 2016 to see that impact, uh, just unbelievable. So permafrost is a pretty major impact as well. Um, quite often we think in terms of archaeological terms, the impact of melting permafrost on organic remains in situ or in the ground still. Um, so we look at you know, the decay of organics, the increase in bacterial activity, and just the loss of these materials before anyone knows they're there. Uh, but there's more immediate, more mechanical impacts of permafrost loss uh, by virtue of these thaw slumps. So these occur where you have uh, really permafrost rich soils or even massive ice lenses within the soils that get exposed through river action uh, or through the impacts of coastal erosion. And as a result, these layers ultimately melt out preferentially. And they can actually result in these giant head walls that form. I don't have much for scale in this one, but this is, this is Professor Max Friesen standing inside this slump. So he would have been right around here. Um, they can get massive. They can be you know, 200, 300 meters across. They can expand dozens of meters in a single warm season. Uh, this was the location of a village site that had been documented in the 1980s, which we went back to try and relocate, uh, and this was all that was left. So there were a few upright timbers from a house that used to be there. Uh, this is an Umiak cross strut, so part of a uh, large skin boat, very important in the harvesting of whales in the area. It was probably incorporated as an architectural element, uh, literally all that remained of that entire village site when we went to visit. So the other impact I want to talk about is sea level rise. Uh, Canada has the greatest national shoreline extent in the world, over 200,000 kilometers of shoreline, most of which is located in Inuit Nunagat. You can see on this map from Natural Resources Canada, our staff at Natural Resources Canada, the sensitivity index to sea level rise within the New Valley Settlement region is quite high. We have this massive area on the Tuktoyak -Tuk Peninsula and within the Mackenzie Delta region. Uh, some other areas in the East Coast are also heavily impacted, but this really is a hotbed for sea level rise and sea level impacts uh, within Canada in general. 
And just to give you an idea of how bad it's getting within the Inugala settlement region, uh, most of Canada is rising up out of the water. Uh, so the landmass with the retreat of glaciers is ultimately popping back up. So you can see in all these green lines, these are essentially the rates of isostatic uplift or of landmass uprising. The dotted line is essentially a fulcrum point. There's no change measured along there, but everything outside of that dotted line is sinking. Um, so it's actually exacerbating the rates of sea level rise that we're seeing as a result of climate change. And you'll note the majority of the Inuvialuit settlement region is within those subsiding land masses. This is just an example of what those plunging uh, landscapes look like uh, when the Beaufort Sea begins to lap up. So to give you an idea of that type of impact, uh, this is the community of Tuktoyaktuk, uh, again, one of the six New Yellow regional centers. Oops, this is what it looks like from the air. So very marine-based economies, uh, marine-based ways of life. They are literally in the ocean, uh, very low-lying land masses by and large. So here we have Tuktoyaktuk from above. And using the most conservative IPCC or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates for sea level change by 80, 20, 100, we're looking at one meter of change. So this is Tuktoyaktuk impacts at the most conservative by 80, 20, 100. Uh, the worst case scenario is being projected roughly 2.6 meters of change by 80, 20, 100. I added a few centimeters for the sake of the subsiding land mass. But I think you can appreciate that Tuktoyaktuk is in line to be very heavily impacted by sea level rise. And it's actually resulted in the community now coming up with contingency plans for perhaps moving back away from the shoreline, uh, armoring the shoreline to protect it while they're getting those movements in place. So we're seeing impacts to Inuvialuit lifeways. Uh, subsistence resources are changing, uh, the timing of prey species coming into and out of the region are changing, and that's having a very major impact. Uh, we're seeing impacts to homes and villages. You know, the village of Tuktoyaktuk, much like Shishmaref shown earlier, uh, heavily impacted by coastal erosion and the moving forward of that sea line. And we're also seeing impacts to heritage. Uh, again, Professor Max Friesen looking at that Igluriak feature out at McKinley Bay. So in 1982, shortly after the Territorial Museum was founded, the NWT Archaeology Program was established. And that very next year in 1983, the Mackenzie Delta Heritage Project was established to address the impacts of erosion on archaeological sites in the Beaufort Delta region. Dr. Charles Arnold, the senior archaeologist at the time and later director of the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Center, noted that the project was developed to accommodate, and I quote, the need to provide opportunities for Northerners to become involved in the study and conservation of their archaeological heritage, unquote. So it's my goal to carry on the work of Dr. Arnold, uh, which he started nearly 40 years ago, supporting a new Yellowwood heritage management needs, with a particular focus on how these vestiges of ancestral lifeways are valued by descendant communities today, in order to inform the development of socially relevant and culturally appropriate management programs. Now, the development of these management responses will also be guided by a number of other resources, including the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which details the rights of Indigenous peoples regarding the maintenance, control, and protection of cultural heritage, as well as the role of the state in recognizing and protecting those rights. We also have the calls to action made by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, which address the responsibility of government in revising current heritage and commemorative policies and practices to more meaningfully integrate Indigenous histories, and modes of heritage valuation. And we also have the Inuvialuit Climate Change Adaptation Strategy and the National Inuit Climate Change Strategy would provide guidance on the effective conduct of climate change adaptation planning within Inuit Nunangat, as well as the essential role of Inuit and Inuvialuit in that planning process. Kuyanani, thank you. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> so um, now we have uh, 10, 15 minutes for questions, if there are anybody. Um, I can uh, start the ball rolling while we wait for things to turn up on the question and answer. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction, the World Leader Summit yesterday promised communities a role in decision making and design of climate programs to support the advancement of Indigenous peoples. I wonder if our panelists might respond how, how this might apply to communities that they are, um, they know about in the Arctic. And subsidiary to that, 
The statement also maintained that indigenous peoples and local communities are nature's most effective guardians. And so they should be at the heart of nature-based solutions to the climate emergency. I wonder if you have any ideas on how museums could support this thought. How about you, Mike, to start with? Right. Uh, so, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is within Canada, the federal government established a pilot program uh, called the Guardians Program. And this is intended to essentially establish Indigenous communities as environmental guardians within the bounds of their traditional territories. Uh, so this involved training, this involved going to communities and seeing what is important there and how an environmental monitoring program can best suit the needs of the community. Um, but quite frankly, I see the role of the museum in that guardian program as extending that uh, monitoring and management process to include cultural heritage. Um, these are individuals who are out on the land all the time. Uh, prior to moving to Inuvik, I only really came up here in the summertime. Um, so I didn't have a holistic understanding of the impacts and the changes that are taking place. Uh, but the hunters and trappers who are out there do, and they see these sites all the time. They might take their boat by them every other day even. Um, so to have that kind of a monitoring program in place, I think is tremendous. And I think it's one way uh, that we can kind of push in on these other more natural science or ecological or biodiversity initiatives um, to extend that into cultural heritage monitoring as well. And I think the museum can really play an important role in that. Thanks, Mike. Um, and May, have you any ideas or thoughts around this question about how uh, the initiatives taken in, uh, in, uh, in Glasgow yesterday might, uh, might impinge on you as a museum practitioner. Uh, one of the issues that we are discussing here is, yeah, the Sami people are uh, seeing the, the consequences of the climate change as, uh, as we are speaking, uh, like the grazing uh, issues, uh, they're very icy, uh, difficult for reindeers to, to get to the, to the uh, to the food uh, and issues like that. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we are discussing here, and I think that also the museum should be a part of uh, to, to try to, to see all the sides of the story, if, if I can say it like that, like um, uh, that the, to protect the way of life that we also, that we have here, even though the, the climate change are uh, in having a big impact on our lives and we are nervous about the future but still it seems like a lot of the areas that we depend on up here uh, but like the reindeer husbandry especially it seems like all the things that these areas are not in use you can actually take the areas and use that to something else like uh, windmills as an example uh, but that will also give a big impact on our way of life here uh, if uh, we are losing more grazing areas like uh, the climate change are making that um, the grazing uh, areas are uh, more and more difficult with the icing issues, uh, but if they are even though taking the areas away from us and using the areas for other things, um, it's, it's like the Sami people have to pay the price for the green shift, like I was trying to say before I got a, mm -hmm. uh, I had struggled with a cough. Um, uh, and I think that that is issues that we need as a museum uh, because we the, the society role that we have is like uh, taking our past and history, um, uh, how it is today and make sure that the people in the future have the same possibility that, that we have. But how to do that when there are so um, like interests that is uh, going against each other in, in lack of other words. Um, like uh, we need to have our grazing areas, we need to have the possibility to, to do our kind of agriculture because the agriculture that we are doing here is dependent on land. We can't, uh, uh, what you call, I don't know the English word for that, but actually uh, cut the grass many, multiple times in a year. We have that one season, we have two months 
to do everything that uh, in other areas of the world you are actually using half a year or something to get the winter food uh, for the animals, but we don't have that. We have two to three months to do that work. Uh, mm. And that depend on areas. Uh, and that's also in the reindeer husbandry, we need the areas. So mm. if we are going to have windmills and pay, paying the price uh, for the, the, the green shift that the world need, but are the indigenous people the ones that actually should be paying the biggest price for that? Um, and also the traditional knowledge, that, that traditional knowledge is something that actually are uh, changing with time. <clears throat> And uh, and the livelihood and how we are uh, living today, uh, but it is a question of how we are going to take that knowledge into the future, um, and that is also something that we work with, and also that okay, the the world is changing in somehow, and how can we make sure that we are also as a museum taking the responsibility for telling about the past, the present, and the future. Uh, and actually museum are the most important part we have is to be a part of the future. Uh, even mm -hmm. a lot of people are thinking like museums are a part, a part of the past, but we're not. We are actually a, a, a big part for the future. And also mm -hmm. um, we have an important role in the future that we want to have. Yeah, so, so I think that a lot of the questions we are talking about in this climate, climate change, farming, uh, ranger husbandry, traditional knowledge, uh, new modern technology like windmills and um, this green shift, in, in my opinion, is not that green where we are paying the price. Um, and a lot of these issues are issues like we as a museum should take a really important part to be active uh talk loud uh and that's also one of the reasons why even though this is in english <laughs> and uh uh that i that i said yes to be a part of this issue but i wanted to speak from uh agriculture uh and rainbow husbandry perspective in this uh, case Thank um you. if i could just um, yeah so i think that i will stop there <laughs> okay, somebody if, I could, if i could bring in kaiser i would just like to um um, and maybe offer the option to uh, to Diego as well. We talked we talked um, about this point about how um, uh, how um, the green shift might be challenging to to the indigenous people. And um, Mike uh, sent a, a little comment to me earlier on about the ethical role of museums and have we a, have we a role here to actually tell it as it is, as Greta Thunberg says, uh, rather than, uh, as you point, you mentioned earlier in your, um, your presentation about giving a rather optimistic uh, view of the events. Uh, I understand, of course, that you didn't actually mean it was going to be ha-ha, but, uh, but there is an ethical dimension here. And I wonder if, Kaiser, you have any thoughts around that? You were talking about this role between the oral and the digital, which I found absolutely fascinating. Um, have we have we this ethical responsibility? I mean, I don't know if you'd like to have talk to each other about that. Absolutely. I, I as we work from this local point of view with an inside perspective, we we really need to pay a lot of attention to this and the thoughts and feelings of people because it's very disturbing these changes that they are experiencing. And we have the history of people coming in and taking our histories and leaving without giving us anything back. So I think it's very important for this local museum to work with what people in the local area think is important and stressful. And we talk a lot about ethics in our projects. It's, it's a big issue for the moment. Uh, whether we should share our narratives or if we should keep them in the community. And, and we're working on a different levels, how to communicate with these changes and, and people's stresses that they are feeling. But we know that the herding community have a lot on their, their minds, they have to deal with these developers, they have to deal with the, the officials that come and they need 
them to be part of all these meetings and it takes a lot of time for them. So the way the, the what I was trying to communicate was this demand of, of an easy, easy way to communicate with the outsiders. So it's, uh, it's, it's a really important mean for the future too. Thank you. I don't know if you have any comments, Diego. Yeah, I would just say, um, no, it's obviously an interesting issue. I wasn't not sure if I would phrase it as ethical or just sort of um, just an essential requirement that museums engage with the great topics of, of, of contemporary debate today. And so I think that it's just uh, inevitable that all museums have to deal with these issues in their own way. And then talking about the sort of the depressing comment that I was talking about, I don't in any way mean that, um, that you know, we're denying the fact that as a species, we're on the tipping point of global change in a very profound and dramatic way. I don't think it's walking away from that as a sort of core message. But what I mean is that the exhibition itself, like the visitor experience of mm. those topics, don't have to be a personal experience, which is depressing, because the aspects of humanity, the cultural stories that we're talking about, are, you know, there to be experienced and sort of reflected on in a different way. I think it's almost like people sometimes don't want to think about climate change because they feel like it's a sort of big issue, whereas actually the reality of experience and exhibition, the reality of thinking about it, the reality of talking to people about it is actually a sort of process by which people learn to deal with the, you know, the epic scale of the problem. So I think it's just maybe the, the use of the word depressing is, a, is, a, is a, the wrong word to use, but that's what I mean. I think that exhibitions can be a place in which these issues can be celebrated, you know, can be dealt with in an in informative and engaging way. Um, you, and I think, of course, museums are going to engage with this topic and they're absolutely vital for, for debating these issues. Hmm, thank you. I just, uh, last couple of minutes, I'd like to send it back to Michael. Um, there, there's uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of voices now saying that we need a new narrative to change from the narrative of the great acceleration and the progress uh, drive that we've had in the last 25 years. Uh, is this what you were talking about, about uh, uh, illustrating the, the less positive sides of, uh, of uh, this um, time that we're living through and how museums should respond to it? I was speaking more in terms of just the, the role that the museum can play, the museum writ large, uh, can play in inciting climate action, um, in getting people you know, uncomfortable with what's happening, um, portraying the more depressing sides of things, and having that spur action, uh, rather than saying, you know, this is fantastic and everybody's adapting, and they are, and they will continue to, as the Inuvialu would have since time immemorial. I mean, changes have never stopped happening in that region. Um, but I feel like today, through the role of the museum as sort of a public outreach arm of heritage overall, um, I see a role for making that uncomfortable linkage or uh, pushing that as kind of, you know, what activist circles call the ethical spectacle, um, making a bit of a hubbub, making people uncomfortable and having that drive action. Mm, thank you very much. Well, I think our time is up there, so I'd like to thank all our three uh, speakers for their very interesting uh, presentations and uh, hand you back over to Joyce Lee uh, for an intermission. Uh, on, Joyce. Thank you, Maureen and all the panelists. The first of our Circumpolar Conversations. I'm Joyce Lee again, um, AAM Environment and Climate Network. And in case you miss our video at the first intermission, we hope you will be inspired by this video of museums that are trailblazers. Do you have a net zero plan? And to support our neighbors to the north, all of us below the Arctic Circle could be pulling in our weight. We couldn't emphasize that enough to stop pollution. Museums moving towards net zero tomorrow are our leaders today. And as said before, we are at the tipping point and we could all be part of the solution. So we hope you enjoy these images again, museums towards net zero, as well as the Nordic music.
and thank you for sticking with us for this third hour of the symposium. Uh, this second panel of, of uh, speakers will talk about the collections and programming that explore Indigenous lifeways. And I'm Angela Lin, a Senior Collections Manager of Ethnology and History at the University of Alaska Museum of the North. Our museum is located on the University of Alaska Fairbanks campus known as Trothyada which is the sacred site of the lower Tanana Dene people. We acknowledge and honor the ancestral and present land stewardship and place-based knowledge of the peoples all across Alaska. We work to amplify that knowledge by the work we do at the museum. Today, I'm honored to act as moderator of this esteemed panel of speakers on opposite sides of the Circumpolar North. We hope that through the research and projects they discuss today, we'll be able to focus on the connections. So the first of our three presenters is Dr. Trude Fonaland, she is a uh, professor in cultural studies at the Arctic University Museum of Norway, UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. Her research interests revolve around Sami museology, contemporary religiosity, tourism, and popular culture. In her presentation today, she'll introduce us to a recently discovered Sami drum and elaborate on what this drum can tell us about Sami lifeways. She asks, in what way do the drum open a view into a Sami episteme? a Sami knowledge, system of knowledge with inherited local knowledge of the environments and how to cope in them. Our second speaker will be Aaron Leggett. And Aaron was born in Anchorage and is Denina Athabaskan. He is a member of the native village of Eklutna and currently serves as the president in chief. He works as the senior curator of Alaska history and indigenous cultures at the Anchorage Museum. He also serves as an advisor for the Smithsonian's Arctic Study Center and as a member of the board of directors for the Cook Inlet Historical Society and the Alaska State Museum Collections Advisory Committee. Mr. Leggett will speak today about the development of a new feature length documentary produced by the Anchorage Museum entitled We Up, Indigenous Hip Hop of the Circumpolar North. Our third speaker is Petra Laiti, Sami rights activist and content director at the National Museum of Finland. Petra Laiti has previously worked with Sami youth issues, land rights, and indigenous self-determination. She's also a blogger and social media personality and has a master's degree in business administration. Ms. Laiti is currently serving as the content director for The Homecoming, an exhibit at the National Museum of Finland featuring part of a collection of Sami items that were repatriated to the Sami community and the Sami Museum Sida this last summer of 2021. So our first speaker will be uh, Dr. Fonalan, and I hand it over to you. I've been asked to talk about collections and programs that explore indigenous lifeways with my own institution as context, namely Rumsa Universiteta Museum, the University Museum in Tromsø. The museum was founded in 1872 and is North Norway's oldest research institution. At the University Museum, our goal is that there must be a dynamic between our collections, our research and research communication. We want our collections to be alive and starting points for knowledge production. In my presentation, I will take a starting point in a recently discovered Sami Guavdis, a Sami drum, and elaborate what this drum, sorry. Um, there. And elaborate what this drum can tell us about Sami lifeways. Guavdis, the drum that you can see in this picture, is one of many elements that can shed light on Sami cultures in the past and present, as well as contribute to new perspectives on it. The drum was found in Hilsa, in the municipality of Riftak, and came to the University Museum of Tromsø during spring 2016. Since our museum has a legal obligation to take care of Sami cultural heritage, that are older than from 1917, it was registered in the museum's collections. But at the same time, the drum was repatriated through close collaboration with the Sami Museum Vardobaiki in Skarnik, and will be part of this museum's coming permanent exhibition. So the drum is soon to return home. As you all know, according to the sources, Guavdis is a tool used by Anwaidi, a Sami religious specialist, as an aid to enter trance. Furthermore, it's said that the drum was used as an instrument of divination. This way, the Noaidi could both foretell the future and communicate with the spiritual powers. However, it is likely that the drum for was used for divination was not a right only reserved for the Noaidi. It could be done by several people. 
In most research literature, these are the religious practices that are known in relation to the use of the drum. Still, I agree with Marisol de la Cardena, who argues that even though practices and concepts can be translated, this does not mean that they can be known easily. We can describe these practices in form that can be them, make them readily understandable to the majority population by creating analogies. But to create an analogies and equivalents, Della Cadena argues, is to erase differences. The drums opens a view into a Sami epistem, a Sami system of knowledge. With epistem, I refer to description of, uh, of Michel Foucault's concept of epistem, which entails a society's system of knowledge and perceptions of the world. These information systems also include inherited local knowledge of the environments and how to cope in them. The Sami researcher Israel Rung has visualized the Sami epistem to a triangular model of knowledge that he calls the reindeer herding triangle. In Rung's model, the three sides of reindeer herding are the landscape, the reindeer and the human. In this triangle, the landscape holds the most crucial role. In his view, the reindeer herding forms in a human, more than human relationship, in which all of these three components have an interrelatedness to each other. All these interrelations affect each other and form the entity of reindeer herding. This type of model can be used to describe many forms of Sami knowledges in which, the, in which the human and landscapes are present. But depending on the type of action, the reindeer could, for example, be the shepherd dog, the salmon, or the sheep, or the landscape could be the guavdis, the drum, that has been carved out of, out of a carefully selected pine burr and that convey a Sami landscape with its invisible and visible structures and powers on its skin. How does this relate to the role and responsibility of museums? We all know what happened to the drums. During the 17th and 18th centuries, perhaps thousands of drums vanished over the period of 100 years. The drums were ripped, smashed, burned in bonfires, forcibly be rounded up by missionaries, or they were hidden in the mountains, like the hills of Guavdis, later found and presented to collectors or museums. Carl Linnaeus, who undertook a five-month-long expedition in Satme in the summer of 1732, provides the descriptions of the brutal methods used when the drums were seized. He writes that, in Norway, I heard of a curious method that someone had used in order to take away the drums and rise pictures from the laps. Having got wind of such objects, he would ask the lap to hand over the drum and the lap would refuse. Having asked the lap for a long time without any success, he takes his arms, pull up his tunic, and before he notices, open the vein at which the lap swoons, begs for his life and agrees to hand them over. He is then immediately bandaged up and the same procedure is applied to many others. Many drums confiscated were sent to curiosity cabinets in Central Europe and to the Missionary Collegium in Copenhagen, where more than 70 drums were lost in a fire in 1728. The destruction of the Sami drums and the concealment of drum in private collections and in museums collections around the world affected the Sami knowledge systems. Without the drum as compass, locals' ways of knowing were lost, or to take Rung's model as an illustration, a central element in the triangular model of knowledge had been brutally removed. Repatriation and also rematriation are an important act of decolonization that opens for reconnection with traditions and practices that were forcibly suppressed. From a philosophical perspective, what the term repatriation does well is to support a shift from objects to beings, expanding recognition of the agency of all beings. As Eva Christina Harleen and Otto Pieski remind us, by exploring the history of collections, their origins, and by sharing this information with the community, we can at best enable objects to be actively involved in empowering and healing processes. In these processes, drum can become means for changing power relationships, for creating identity and memory. As Marit Mirvol, former leader of Vardobaiki Sami Govdash at Skarnik, where the drum will be displayed, argues, the drums are agents in contemporary struggles for Sami identity and history. Each time an object, a building construction or other material culture are identified and made visible, there will be less to explain for the individual Sami about why one should be allowed to call a particular area Sami.
It is the responsibility of museums to open for dialogue, for contact work and to repatriate the drums. In a time of eco-crisis, it is more relevant than ever to relearn the Sami epistems, the local knowledge systems, that the drum is but one to represent, to create sustainable Sami futures. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Aaron Leggett from the Anchorage Museum. You can see the full screen. Perfect. Okay, hello everybody. Again, my name is Aaron Leggett, the Senior Curator of Alaska History and Indigenous Culture at the Anchorage Museum, and I'm the executive producer of We Up, Indigenous Hip Hop of the Circumpolar North, a film that was produced and created by the Anchorage Museum. In 2017, the Anchorage Museum um, decided that it wanted to document what we saw was an increasing uh, renaissance of young indigenous uh, hip hop performers throughout the circumpolar north. And so as we uh, endeavored on this, we um, identified some key individuals and as the process was going on, which is what I'll be talking about kind of behind the scenes, we watched it grow and evolve beyond anything that we had even imagined. Um, in the spring of 2017, uh, Akalu uh, Berthelsen, uh, Uyarak came to the Anchorage Museum as part of our first North by North uh, festival. He's a producer um, and DJ of Greenlandic hip hop and is well connected with um, performing artists in Greenland. And we, um, we met with him, we kind of discussed our ideas. He was very encouraged by this and we continued uh, moving forward. Our first interviews were done in Anchorage um, in the summer of 2017, and we interviewed various uh, local hip hop uh, artists and uh, practitioners. Here we have uh, Ariel Taylor or Bisco. He's uh, a, actually a graffiti artist. He's not a performing artist, but um, we wanted to highlight, um, you know, graffiti, dance, DJing, and uh, rapping or or hip hop. Uh, here we have Allison Warden Akuma Tu. Uh, from Kaktovik, Alaska, uh, who's been probably the most famous um, rapper, uh, indigenous rapper right now out of, out of Alaska, and she's traveled quite a bit throughout the Circumpolar North. Um, as we were uh, talking with um, uh, Akalu, he had suggested that he would be performing at the 2017 Ridu Ridu Festival, and we decided um, after looking at the lineup and knowing also that Allison had been invited to perform there that we would do our first set of filming there. So we flew into Tramsa or Ramsa and we drove for about two hours um, to a small town uh, called Shibatan. It's about 20 minutes from the festival itself and uh, it's on the coast, a little fishing town. It's claim to fame actually has a connection ironically, back to Alaska, there were a lot of coincidental things that happened. Uh, Shibatan is uh, the home of Leonard Seppala, the famous um, dog musher who was involved in the, um, the serum run between uh, Anchorage and uh, Nome when there was a diphtheria outbreak. There have been several movies uh, made um, where he's involved. In fact, one just came out a couple of years ago uh, by Disney, uh, that it kind of gives a dramatic retelling of it. And the place that we stayed at was a small uh, Kven um, house that had been built, been built about a hundred years before. And as it turned out, he was a relative uh, several generations back through his grandmother to Leonard Seppala, but he was also, uh, we had no idea at the time, a videographer. And so we kind of explained to him why these two guys, these two guys and one woman from Alaska were uh, going to Ridu Ridu uh, to film this Northern indigenous uh, hip hop. So here's a, a shot of the festival uh, grounds itself. It's uh, in the Mandalin Valley. It's a beautiful location. It's uh, a site of, of, I would argue, Northern indigenous Renaissance, but in particular, uh, it holds a special meaning obviously for the, the Sami, uh, bringing them from throughout the uh, four countries. Um, and it's really kind of a celebration of all of that. 
Here's a shot of the main stage here. You can see people gathered. Uh, here, the director, uh, David Holthouse, is interviewing Akalu. Um, uh, are in our first set of interviews and he's discussing kind of his methodology of how uh, he works to create um, beats and his work working with Greenlandic uh, hip hop artists. Here we can see the ever colorful uh, Aku Matu or Allison Warden who was performing um, at the festival. So we were there to do interviews um, and to capture Allison's performance uh, in particular in 2017. Allison's mother's uh, standing in the background. She brought her with her all the way um, to the festival, which was really great. And uh, although he was not performing uh, that year in 2017 at Ridridu, uh, Slyn Kraze, another uh, Norwegian Sami rapper, was there and we were able to conduct an interview and, and make a connection and explain kind of uh, what we were doing there and one of the things was we've gotten questions often about uh, what is it about hip hop that uh, attracts um, young people? And uh, although we didn't prompt them, they all came back and, and basically said the same thing. It, it had to do with, I think, obviously the, the idea of marginalized people and the struggle, but also the thing that really struck us as we conducted more and more interviews was that the, the form of hip hop lends itself to storytelling and oral tradition. And when we realized that indigenous people of the North come from oral traditions, that um, this is a way of creatively expressing oneself. And uh, for all of the interviewees, um, cultural revitalization, language loss, um, loss of lands, climate change, all these things all rolled together. So even though um, all our interviewees um, don't speak a common language and in some ways they actually do. So after uh, the festival in 2017, um, well, we, at, while at the festival, we met uh, Ailu Vale, a Finnish uh, Sami rapper and uh, Ailu very um, courteously invited us to come back um, with him to Inari uh, to film him at his home where he was living at. And so that required us to figure out how to get there. So from the Mandalin Valley, uh, we uh, drove through Sami, the Sami homeland uh, from Norway into Finland. And we broke it up over two days um, and stopped at this small ski town in Levy, um, which actually has a great uh, Sami Museum. We were kind of surprised, uh, at least I was, uh, when we looked at the name of this little museum and this hotel, it was called Sami Land, kind of like Disneyland, but it actually had participation from Sami people, and um, I was quite impressed. Uh, by the time we got to Levy, though, uh, we experienced uh, a little bit of car troubles, and we were afraid that I wouldn't be able to get back all the way to Tromso and miss my flight. So Unfortunately, um, we had to take a bit of a detour. Here's a shot of crossing uh, over from Norway into uh, Finland. Uh, you can see the flags of the three countries. It also borders the, the top of, of Sweden as well. In the landscape itself, obviously, uh, reindeer are ubiquitous. Um, and so here's a shot of them. Here's some more reindeer in front of our hotel in Levy. Um, so yeah, here the destination was to go from Levy up to Inari. Uh, unfortunately, I had to make a detour because of the car troubles and go to uh, Rovaniemi and then had to take a bus back from Rovaniemi uh, uh, all the way back into to Tromso in 2017. Here's just a landscape shot. Um, but I think it's really important that, um, uh, that the film has a lot of shots of the land. Obviously the connections between um, Northern Finland, Northern Norway, uh, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland all have clear connections. And it really is about the idea of centering people to the land and um, language. Here's a shot of uh, going back into Tromso and one of our partners at the Northern Norway uh, Art Museum's on the right here next to a statue of Roald Amundsen who also has a connection 
back to Alaska being the first one to go through the Northwest Passage. Um, our next set of filming was done in uh, Nuke, Greenland. Uh, although I did not uh, go uh, to Nuke, it was incredibly expensive. This was all done on a, a very modest budget. Uh, we were able to piggyback onto another project um, that the museum was supporting uh, about the revitalization of Inuit tattooing. And we were able to turn over our, our camera equipment and have a series of interviews done on the, based on the recommendations from Akalu including uh, Kimo Jacks here uh, and uh, Tarak. Um, and so then uh, a couple months later and the end of November, we were able to at the Anchorage Museum bring Slim Craze uh, up to Anchorage uh, to both show his documentary on the actually the same phenomenon, although it's very much much more of a personal story called Arctic Superstar. If you haven't seen it, I'd highly recommend it. Here's uh, Slynn and I doing a, a early morning interview um, on a local television station where he performed in um, Northern Sami uh, in his, his, his amazing rap style uh, and then promoting uh, the film. So then uh, moving into the spring of uh, 2018, uh, the Anchorage Museum was again able to bring um, Ailu Vale from Finland and uh, Akalu uh, to DJ. Uh, so uh, bringing that collaboration together, uh, you know, in Anchorage as part of our second year of our North by North um, festival uh, to get people in Anchorage kind of exposed and, and sort of a little bit of a preview to what we were developing. When we were at the um, the festival in um, in 2017, um, we interviewed uh, the um, then director of the festival, uh, Carolina Trulvik, um, and when we were, she was again very fascinated. What are these two um, two guys from Alaska doing in um, in northern Norway? And we kind of explained what we were doing and we asked, you know, the, the ideas behind uh, hip hop and, and what the attraction to it was. And I think we planted a bit of a seed uh, into her head that maybe this is something that the festival itself self should really um, promote. And that's exactly what it did in uh, 2018 in, in developing it. Then uh, in the early summer of 2018, we traveled to Fairbanks where we interviewed uh, Julian Lilly, Bishop Slice uh, in Fairbanks, the second largest city in Alaska. And then uh, much like um, Ailu uh, had suggested that uh, we should make a car trip with him to his village at Dot Lake. So we drove again for about two and a half hours south of Fairbanks to Dot Lake. Um, where we went to uh, Julian's uh, great grandmother's fish camp and did some um, live recording of him rapping right in the land. Here's Julian um, with a couple of his cousins who were in the film and uh, at the fish camp. So, um, so yeah, and then we got word in 2018 that this circumpolar hip hop collaboration was going to occur largely organized by uh, Akalu and featuring um, some of the people that we had, had already interviewed and, and also incorporated even more. There's just another shot of it. Here you can see David Holthouse talking with Ailu Vale and Akalu. Uh, this is Yarosim uh, Gulkin, who is a Russian um, Sami rapper uh, who we, we met at the festival. Here's uh, the collaboration uh, that performed minus, no, actually that's all of them. So we have Amok, um, Mikkal Moritya, um, who's another Finnish uh, Sami rapper, uh, Ailu Vale's sister, uh, Ella Marit, uh, Ailu, um, Aku Matu, uh, Allison Warden, uh, Hilda Lansman, uh, Alexi uh, uh, Galloway, uh, who's an Inuit uh, throat singer slash contemporary artist, Yarsam, Kimo Jacks, um, 
and uh, Akalu and uh, his uh, girlfriend, who I'm blanking on the name, and I apologize. So um, our, our host from the previous year uh, board, whose house that we saw earlier that he was renting out on um, Airbnb, uh, we were able to hire him to do some behind the scenes filming and some of the actual filming during the performance uh, itself. And here is the, um, the actual performance um, that happened. Uh, it closed out the festival uh, in 2018. Uh, it was the Circumpolar Cipher is kind of uh, the, the informal name uh, for it. And this is of course all highlighted in our film which um, is available uh, for free to stream on the Anchorage Museum's website. If you just type in We Hip Hop, We Up, Indigenous Hip Hop of the Circumpolar North, you'll be able to uh, get a chance to, um, to see the film and, and some, uh, uh, some of the, the more details uh, about it. And also as uh, another outgrowth of the, uh, the collaboration and the film, uh, we, the Anchorage Museum was able to produce a record slash uh, digital downloads of all the artists featured uh, in the film and, um, and the, the special uh, song that was created, the Circumpolar Cipher, um, for this uh, particular um, film. So I just want to give a little bit of a behind the scenes look at this and I will end it there. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. What a fascinating uh, project that spans the globe and uh, really focuses on contemporary voices. I love it. Okay, so our third panelist this morning, or morning in, in Fairbanks, um, is uh, Petra Laiti, and she will uh, come online next. Thank you. Hi, just a second. I'm setting up my presentation. I hope you all can hear me. Uh, so hello everyone, um, and thank you for being here today and listening to us. Um, my name is uh, Petra Laiti, and I'm a Sami rights advocate based in Finland. Um, I do a lot of uh, social media and writing. Um, I have a column and, and I record podcasts, uh, and, I all, uh, and I do all of that uh, to, uh, in one way or another, discuss uh, Sami rights and the status of, of the Sami in Finland uh, and the advancement of indigenous rights in the Nordics. Um, and the project that I, I'm going to speak on today is a very interesting one. Um, about a year ago, uh, I was invited to be a part of the homecoming exhibition for the National Museum in Finland. Uh, and I've been uh, working on that project as their uh, content director for that exhibition. Um, I'm going to show a very short uh, slideshow just to go over some uh, basic facts about the exhibition and then uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what we learned uh, during the project itself. So just a second while I share my screen. Uh, so just to give you a brief overview of the homecoming exhibition, um, basically uh, the homecoming exhibition uh, is a historic happening in, in Finland. Uh, it is about repatriation. Um, the National Museum of Finland uh, has this year, this summer, uh, returned over 2,000 uh, Sami artifacts from its collections to uh, the Sami community and the Sp Sami Museum Sida. Uh, so that happened uh, just a few weeks ago. And the exhibition itself uh, opened uh, on Saturday. So it's very recent. Um, the exhibition itself uh, includes uh, about 150 items from the Sami collection, uh, but also archived materials, old photos, um, and uh, contemporary artworks by, by selected Sami artists. Uh, the, the planning itself and uh, what we call the multi-art implementation of the exhibition entity uh, have been carried out together with the Sami community uh, and the Sami Museum CEDA. And it's this collaborative effort that I'm gonna uh, share a little bit more about. 
Um, but what that meant in practice is that uh, we had a 10 person working group, uh, including representatives from both uh, museums, as well as uh, three external consultants from the Sami community. So that would include um, Sami artist uh, Oti Pieski, who was also mentioned uh, before. Um, she was in charge of uh, selecting the artwork uh, for the exhibition, so the art director. Uh, then we had uh, young uh, artist and photographer Lada Suomerinne, also a Sami artist uh, who was uh, tasked with the visual direction of, of the exhibition itself. And then we had myself as the content director. So I was responsible for uh, basically curating the texts uh, for the exhibition. Uh, we had a very intense schedule uh, and a long one at that. Uh, when I came along to the process, um, the, the working group had already been meeting for many, many months. Uh, but we met basically uh, every week for almost a year, uh, and every time we met, we would have uh, discussions that lasted for hours. Um, and when we got into the practicality of it all, uh, it all meant uh, a thorough involvement and participation uh, by us external consultants and the, the Sami Museum. Uh, in any and all processes regarding the exhibition. So it would be anything from communications to marketing, to planning the guide tours, uh, to selecting the shop items. Uh, and we also had extensive discussions and workshops uh, and trainings for museum staff uh, and also people who, who work within the, um, the public uh, museum sphere in Finland. So we had a lot of internal processes going on at the same time as we were planning the exhibition itself. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now uh, and I'm going to continue talking. So just a second. Right. Uh, so that in its essence uh, is uh, the homecoming exhibition and it will be up until um, the end of February 22. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we learned and, and what kind of discussions we had within the working group, because I think that's very, very relevant to uh, the themes of Indigenous participation and and uh, what repatriation can teach us as a whole. Um, now, obviously, uh, repatriation isn't just about the concrete transfer of an item or, or a collection, uh, but rather it always tells uh, a larger story of the society where it takes place. Um, and the way I see it, uh, repatriation is very much a transfer of power. Uh, it's about the, the dominating party giving up some of its power and returning the power to the indigenous community in question. So talking about power was uh, very central to our working group. Um, and within the working group itself, we didn't really make any distinctions between who was employed at which museum, uh, but rather we approached it from a Sami centric point of view. So it didn't really matter if, if we were the Sami people who were employed at the, the National Museum or at CETA, but we, we really just put uh, our efforts into uh, putting the Sami point of view uh, in the center. Um, so that meant that the members of the Sami community in the working group were giving a lot of uh, uh, were given a lot of leeway to talk and to voice our opinions, and then we would take those ideas and, and thoughts and, and discuss them as a group and come up with a consensus based proposal that was then developed further. Um, and the other important issue that we had to talk about almost every week was uh, ignorance, uh, which often goes hand in hand with, with power when it comes to indigenous issues. Um, now, our challenge was the fact that uh, the Finnish majority population is ignorant of Sami issues to such a degree that the European Commission Against uh, Racism and Intolerance uh, has pointed it out to the state uh, in one of the reports. Um, and there's a lot of misinformation and racist uh, stereotypes about the Sami. So we had to take these, this uh, task of education very seriously. Um, also because uh, that structural ignorance uh, exists in the museum world. Um, and that's why we had those workshops and dialogues and trainings for museum employees and guides and for the people working in, in customer service, because we wanted to prepare them to meet with museum visitors in a way where you sort of um, know how to gently push the visitor towards proper information uh, and away from, say, incorrect language and uh, intolerant behavior. Uh, we also had to discuss uh, any and all topics that, that we had at length 
in order to make sure that the cultural context and messages were spelled out for the non-Sami members of the working group, uh, or at least those who weren't savvy in, in Sami issues to begin with. Uh, so I know for a fact that the exhibition has been a huge uh, learning experience for them too. Um, but I do want to say about participation in itself, um, I do believe it is a rabbit hole in a way, um, because if you're used to operating on a very basic level of Indigenous participation, meaning very symbolic, uh, nothing major, where it's more so about signing an approval rather than involving Indigenous people in your work, um, then it will be very difficult for you to understand how deeply the need um, for Indigenous participation goes. Because once you include Indigenous people in your working group uh, and start to plan an exhibition like this, or even on a societal level, if you start to plan legislation or, or what have you, uh, it always comes down, come down to the fact that you do have to confront your own ignorance uh, on those issues. And you do have to confess to yourself that maybe your organization isn't even doing the bare minimum. So it does take a lot of humility for, um, for a museum to bring in indigenous experts to work on an indigenous exhibition. And even then, even if you have that humility and you have that uh, positive attitude towards that process, it will be challenging often. Because basically what you're, what you're trying to do, in our case especially, is you're trying to do an exhibition um, that is educating the general audiences about an issue that you yourself are also ignorant on. And in order to give out the right message and make sure you're giving out the correct message, uh, you do have to involve the people in question. You have to share your power, uh, give some of your power away, much like with the repatriation process itself, um, in order to make sure that your exhibition is done right um, and is telling the correct things, telling the correct stories, the, the correct history and honoring the indigenous people in question. Um, and it can come down to any kind of detail from the way the, the items are placed um, to the way the artwork relates to the items, to the colors used in marketing leaflets, to a guide not knowing which words or names to use about the people in question. So when you stack up the levels at which the majority of people just don't understand indigenous culture, only then do you start to see the scale at which you need to involve your indigenous experts. Um, so proper indigenous participation takes a lot of guts. Um, it takes humility. It takes the ability to uh, self-reflect. And of course, it does take resources. Uh, I was very pleased to see money mentioned as, as an interesting factor earlier today, because it does take that as well. Um, because you do have to be willing to submit to the fact that relearning things is going to cost uh, and reforming things is going to cost. Um, but I wouldn't say it will cost just money. I also think in a, in a lot of ways, it will cost you your pride. Um, because while I fully understand that, that museums all around the world um, and cultural institutions uh, as a whole are used to being in a bit of an underdog position, used to defending your own position in terms of funding or appreciation uh, in relation to your country or your government. But when it comes to indigenous people, you do need to understand uh, that you are part of that machine. And you do need to recognize that in order to appreciate where indigenous people are coming from with their arguments, their ideas and discussions, when indigenous people say that you do have power um, and you do need to uh, give some of it back to where it belongs. Um, only once you accept that message and do commit to that process, that's when you've uh, succeeded in indigenous participation. Uh, that's the kinds of thoughts that I'm going to leave you with today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that wonderful wrap up and, and tie into many of the questions I had, had set for myself to ask uh, our panel and I'd ask each of you to, to turn your cameras back on so that we can have our discussion here for the last 15 minutes or so and, and I'd encourage folks to add questions to the Q&A uh, button or through the chat window. Um, this has just been a, a great wrap up to think about how um, different kinds of, of uh, staff and programs and research and exhibitions um, can, can really celebrate 
uh, diversity of knowledge and, and experiences and perspectives. And, and so I want to um, follow up on, on one of the, the things that you brought up, uh, Petra, uh, it, about language um, and power. Um, you know, we, many of our, our discussions here have, have talked about language and, and the tie of, to cultural strength and identity and, and political power. We've asked all of our presenters today to speak in English. Um, you know, this, how, how do you see uh, the use of indigenous languages uh, within museums as part of uh, the presentation of indigenous culture and knowledge um, within maybe your institutions or, or ways that you think that museums can improve uh, the way that we open um, and, and be more accessible to different groups of people uh, who are, are um, coming from different perspectives and, and would like to get into that power structure. Um, just any of you can, can jump in here how you've seen the use of language as a, as a liberating um, way of, of sharing knowledge and, and culture. Um, if I may, uh, I can give you an example of uh, of our exhibition where we've done the the homecoming exhibition in six languages, uh, meaning three Sami languages uh, and three majority languages. So uh, Finnish, Swedish and English. Um, and uh, of course, it's about uh, honoring the languages themselves and, and the people who speak it. Uh, I was very pleased to see it in, in my own mother tongue in, in northern Sami. Um, but it's also about um, well, there's the, the education theme where not all Finns are even aware that there are differences between Sami languages and why that even matters. So that's one. But one thing that we really, or I really liked about the exhibition as well is the fact that we've prioritized the Sami languages in a way that the Sami uh, texts are always visible first. And only then you go to the majority languages. So it's very much simulating the experience of an indigenous person searching for their language uh, in that sea of text. Um, so that's what we've been doing in this, this exhibition as well. So I do think it, it does hold a lot of symbolic value and a lot of, um, I guess, um, rights value, but it does also uh, serve as a really effective reminder of the fact that um, what the different privileges are in, in which country and in which context. So I do like language as a tool also to simulate that experience. Erin, you spoke specifically about uh, language use in, in your uh, film that you're working on. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, contemporary rappers are, are using their language uh, or impacted by uh, the, their indigenous languages in, in this uh, mode of expression? Yeah, well, I think, um... Most specifically, so in the film, um, we have uh, two different Sami dialects um, depicted. And what's fascinating is Sami, in my opinion, lends itself quite nicely to, um, to rap. And it has a, a poetry uh, to, its, to it. And when you see somebody like Slyn Craze, who raps in a very fast style, very reminiscent of say like Eminem, uh, but he's able to do it in Northern Sami. It, it's sort of a, a feat to be seen. Um, the Greenlandic artists uh, certainly as well, um, you know, for Alaska indigenous languages, very few are spoken as, as a first language. So it's kind of a rebuilding and it's sort of incorporating uh, it, you know, words or phrases into the uh, particular raps themselves. But again, um, what's fascinating is that it's, it's when, when you translate them into a common language, in this case, English, there are so many overlaps and parallels, um, which we kind of knew, but it sort of was reinforced. And, and even the, the rappers themselves realized that we share a common language in the sense of, of the history of colonization and language removal in the North uh, and, and revitalization so that it, it comes through uh, in a way. And if I also can ask you a question, Aaron, because I think it was really interesting to, to hear about this uh, film project. What, what was, was the effect of this film project within the Anchorage Museum? Did you see any, did you see any effects? Well, um, so, 
we had our premiere we were scheduled to have our world premiere at the Anchorage International Film Festival. And uh, two days before the premiere, uh, we had the second largest earthquake recorded uh, in my, uh, or in the last, in the 20th century. So that we had to change venues and people were kind of in a bit of a rebuilding. And then, um, so it premiered at the end of 2018. Uh, we got it into some film festivals. We were kind of building it. And then our hope was to have another um, event in uh, 2020, in the spring of 2020, and COVID kind of put the brakes on it. So we, we've been able to get it into um, very a few film festivals, certainly um, throughout the North. But I would say it has not had as big of an impact on the community that I hoped, and one of the reasons I, you know, wanted to bring this up was specifically for that. But, but I would say the impact most definitely has been with um, the rappers themselves. Um, they've all made these connections, and and Akalu, um, just as kind of a, a backstory, um, came to Anchorage um, in 2017. He met his girlfriend Suna. That was her name, and I, I apologize for not remembering it earlier. And then they had met briefly and then he re-met her at Redo Redo, they fell in love and he actually ended up moving to Inari uh, where he was working with uh, various rappers. And I know he's done a lot of work now in Finland. Um, so there have been these connections that have been strengthened certainly by the film. Would they have happened without it? Yeah, I think they would have, but I think it accelerated the process. And I think it puts some legitimacy, I think, to this idea. Yeah, this this idea of creating communities as a as a um, as an outgrowth of these uh, collaborations and these advisory groups. Um, I'm really interested in in you know we've all heard from these these wonderful projects throughout the morning about collaboration, participation, partnerships. So could you talk a little bit, you know, you've all been involved in these things and, and you probably have had the positives and negatives that, that you've experienced. Can you talk a little bit about things that you wish would have happened or ways that you think that this collaborative process might be improved for those of us online who are trying to learn to, to do a better job, being more open, swallowing that pride, as you said, Petra, um, and, and confronting our ignorance. Um, how can we as museum professionals do a better job uh, in handing over, you know, sharing authority, handing over power, uh, it, repatriating not just knowledge and, and physical objects, but but you know, sharing meaningfully in this process. I think real quick, um, Angie, I, I think the most important thing is, is a willingness to, to share power, but also time, giving it the time necessary to build these relationships and, and work into the communities and sometimes going to those actual communities before any of the actual kind of work is to be done, I think is really important. Um, and, you know, emphasizing those kinds of things, I would say. I would just say that I really agree with you. It's, uh, it's about taking the time and not be afraid of, of sharing the knowledge um, and just open up and yeah. Mm. One thing that I, I might add to or I suppose it's part of uh, taking your time, but it's also about not necessarily being dismissive about um, really in-depth discussions about really detailed things, um, because all of that, um, I mean, of course, it depends on the context and the indigenous community in question, right? But uh, in our um, project, for instance, we had really, um, I guess from a Western point of view, it would be a really inefficient use of time where we would use all of those hours that we had in order to discuss choice of color and choice of pattern and whatever you, you can name. We, we certainly talked about it, but it was also very important for us to, to talk about all of that, not just for our own sakes to feel confident in the projects that we have, uh, but also for um, the, the other participants in the working group to understand the 
vast scope of indigenous lens and, and what indigenous people will be looking at when they enter that space. Um, and, and the way I see it is that we try to, from the very get go, we tried to make an exhibition that even though it's in Helsinki and it's uh, in the capital and it's very far away from Sami territory, uh, that it's still a space that a Sami person can walk into and feel welcome and feel at home. And that rather this time it would be the non-Sami person who feels as though they are with a different culture. Um, so all of those details, it, it, it serves a cultural purpose in the moment uh, and it does carry that project uh, a long way. Yeah, just one more thing I wanted to add. Also, I think it's important to not reinvent the wheel every time to look at other successful projects. And certainly I know in all the work that we do at the Anchorage Museum, one of the things we're working very hard to do to, to partner with other institutions throughout the Circumpolar North. And I'm very fortunate to have visited most of the museums that have been discussed here and see uh, the various exhibitions and, and learn from those and meet with people that have been involved in them and, and learn from some of the failures, you know, and, and some of those as well. Absolutely, failure can, can be a, a real learning opportunity. Um, any questions from our audience? I see we still have uh, 87 or so people online. Uh, this is a great opportunity to ask your questions about these indigenous programming, exhibitions, knowledge-based uh, research. Uh, anyone has any questions, please throw it in the Q&A. Um, our panelists, if you have any more questions for one another, um, be happy to hand over the floor. I would love to hear more about this um, Petras project while we're waiting for other questions, because I was just wondering whether any, were there any kind of conflict zones within this repatriation pro project? Uh, right, well, um, not necessarily within the working group, uh, and that was because we had and we took the time in the world <laughs> to, to go through those discussions, but I think one a uh, particular field where we met into very different uh, worldviews, so to say. And I realized this because I, I've studied economics myself, but that was the marketing of the exhibition. Um, and it was just about the, the conflict in, in ideology between making a marketable exhibition and, and uh, basically making merchandise or, or advertising indigenous culture. And there's so many sensitivities to that and so many ways it could go wrong. And it was just a, a really tedious process to get that right. Um, and of course, uh, not everyone at or any museum has the time in the world to, to participate in those hour long discussions that the working group did. So sometimes, uh, one of the challenges was the fact that you'd have to reiterate yourself to different parties within the organization who had not had the chance to be with us for all that time. But that also just showed how important those discussions were um, to the working group and to the exhibition itself and uh, what kinds of challenges it does pose when, when there are parts of the organization who are not um, as intensely involved in indigenous collaboration. And it really did also show the fact that uh, that was also one field where the indigenous experts were very necessary and very needed. But yeah, so that that commercialization and, and marketing was definitely a difficult one. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Amber just posed a question and it was one that I'd been thinking about, you know, to talk about. We just have a couple more minutes here. Um, thinking about this collaboration, these uh, this indigenous knowledge, do you see a way that that we can go beyond just our programming, our exhibitions, um, these temporary kinds of activities? Are there ways that that this indigenous knowledge can get better integrated into museums and supplant some of this this uh, you know institutional racism and and restrictions that 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 we're all trying to grapple with right now as museums are growing and, and changing? Uh, do you have any any of our panelists have thoughts about that that real integration of of indigenous knowledge and social values and things like that into museums? Yeah, Angie, I'll I'll take that. One thing that the Anchorage Museum has been doing for the last few years in every one of our exhibitions, we do a land acknowledgement that clearly says that this is the traditional homeland 
turns out of, of my people uh, from the Anchorage area, and that we want to thank the past, present, and future stewardship of, of the land in which the Anchorage Museum sits on. Also on the front of our building in 30 foot letters, we have a declarative statement that says this is Denina Ethnena, meaning this is the Denina homeland. So we're putting out forward facing uh, where we stand on this and that we clearly recognize that this is um, my people's traditional homeland. So those are just a few examples that really kind of set the tone for the entire institution, I would argue. Thank you so much for that, Aaron. So I think we've we've hit our, our time limit here. Um, I really would like to thank this wonderfully diverse group of folks uh, who've joined me here for this last panel, our previous panelists and our keynote speakers, the moderators. Um, and especially I'd like to thank Leslie Anderson at the National Nordic Museum in Seattle for helping to keep us all coordinated despite all of these different time zones that we're all uh, representing today. Um, and so now I will shift over to uh, some words from Eric Nelson, the executive director and CEO of the National Nordic Museum for our closing remarks. Thanks. Hello, my name is Eric Nelson. I'm the executive director and CEO of the National Nordic Museum here in Seattle. I wanna thank you all for joining us on this symposium. Um, it was wonderful to have this gathering of museum professionals from the Arctic who are truly on the front line of global climate change, as well as those who have dedicated their work to center on this region. Um, they're raising awareness of climate emergency and amplifying the voices of indigenous communities who are most affected by it. The National Nordic Museum's core values, of connection to nature, and social justice led us to host the symposium. We have been proud to partner with the American Alliance of Museums, Environmental and Climate Network, ICOM's Working Group on Sustainability, and the National Museum Directors Council of the UK. I want to thank our partners, as well as the keynote speakers, panelists, moderators, and the steering committee who put this program together to coincide with COP26. This is the most important issue facing the world today, and it's wonderful to have museums that are on the front lines participating at this level. Thank you all for joining us, and all the best.